What's that? Okay, Northwestern student athletes are on their way. Update on satellite coordinates for press conferences today and tomorrow. We have new satellite coordinates for today and tomorrow. The upload link is SES3 slash 17KC9. And the download frequency is 12044.5H. Once again, Upload link is SES3 slash 17K C9, and the download frequency is 12044.5H. New satellite coordinates for today. Okay, we have Northwestern student athletes up on the podium. We have grad guard Boo Booey. We have junior guard Brooks Barnheiser. We'll take questions for them. We got them for about 17 more minutes. Then we'll have Coach Collins from 155 to 215. The Northwestern locker room also is open. 
So if we don't get it to everything here, you can still get these guys at the locker room. So we'll go right into questions. If you have one, just raise your hand. We'll get a microphone. We have one on each side. We'll get it to you. We're going to start here right in front of me, row two. Yeah, you share a lot of you Northwestern. Either, I guess for either of you, having beaten a number one team in Purdue in back-to-back -back seasons, how does that help prepare you for another kind of matchup against the number one team in Connecticut tomorrow? Why don't we start with Boo, and then we'll go to Brooks. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think it's just great preparation. Uh, we played against great teams all year long. Uh, so, I mean, playing against the number one is, is just – like you said, you know, we, we played against the number one before, so it's kind of a been there, done that, uh, done that mentality. Uh, obviously, they're a great team, so we're going to have to just be dialed, dialed in and locked in from the jump for all 40 minutes. Uh, but it gives us great confidence, you know, uh, because we've done it before, we, we've seen it, and, you know, we all believe in ourselves a bunch, so. Yeah, I think the league that we play in, um, and kind of like you said, just having uh, playing, um, you know, really good teams like that, uh, it definitely helps. And I think that uh, the Big Ten is super physical, and UConn is also super physical. So we're definitely, uh, you know, been battle tested in terms of playing really good teams and playing, you know, some of the top teams in the country. So I think that, you know, we've seen that we've done it before. It kind of gives us a little motivation that, to know that, you know, we're able to be in this game and, you know, we're confident in going into the game. So it's definitely a really good opportunity just for us to play, you know, the number one overall seed in the tournament. So it's a blessing. We're going to go to the other side of the room. Yep. Uh, Matt Shelton, Wildcat Report. For Boo, just coming off a game against John L. Davis. Now you're playing Tristan Newton. You've called yourself the best point guard in the country. Do you relish these opportunities to go up against some of the country's other best players in your position? I mean, yeah, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a competitor, so, you know, I'm just, you know, I'm, but I'm going out there for the, for the team. You know, that's the only thing I'm thinking about is, is the team and winning. Uh, nothing personal, you know, in between anyone or accolades like that. Uh, you know, I'm just trying to go out there <clears throat> be, and be most prepared for myself and, and for my teammates and have my teammates prepare for the game. Uh, yeah, so I'm not, I'm not getting into any one-on-one -on -one matchups or anything like that. You know, I'm just going to go out there and try to win the game. We'll stay on that same row on the aisle. Go ahead. Uh, Louis Vicar, Wildcat Report. Uh, Brooks, we saw the uh, Buffalo Wild Wings ad last night. I just wonder, how did that come about? Who contacted who? I assume it's an NIL deal. And what's your flavor? Yeah, so uh, we actually have a, a really good uh, program, like True and You, that kind of helps us uh, navigate all NIL stuff like with uh, within our team and for Northwestern. And really, it was just uh, um, our guy that works with our team just put me in a group chat with a guy from Buffalo Wild Wings, and he was like, hey, there's this opportunity if you want it. And I thought it was kind of cool. I thought it was kind of funny because uh, it had to happen really fast because they want to get it out there. So I don't know if you saw, but the pictures were not very great quality or anything like that. But yeah, it was just kind of cool. And uh, I'm kind of a dry rub guy, not really into like a lot of sauces. So kind of a basic guy, but it was a really cool opportunity. And it was cool to you know have that uh, possibility. We'll stay on the same side in row one. Just raise your hand real quick so the guys know which one. Yep, go ahead, raise your hand so they, just see, so they know where oh. they're looking. Uh, Bill, Cam Spencer at Rutgers last year had a big game against you the first time you met. Not, not as much the second time, but what, uh, what do you remember from him uh, as a player, and what are you guys going to do you know, tomorrow to kind of keep him in check? Yeah, uh, Cam is, is a really good player. You know, he shoots it very well. You know, he can put it on the floor. Uh, you know, but I, like you said, I played against him before, uh, so <clears throat> I kind of got some... Uh, familiarness with him. Uh, I know his older brother. I play with his older brother, Pat. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're, uh, I'm kind of close with Pat. So, <clears throat> I mean, we're, we're just going to have to be dialed in on him, you know, try to limit him from getting, getting to where he wants to get and uh, take away some of his actions that he likes to get to. We're going to come to this side of the room on the aisle. Yep, go ahead, row four. Uh, for both of the guys, uh, how much did winning those overtime games against Purdue and Illinois help you last night when you're down two with ten, less than 10 seconds and then you got to go overtime again. Start with Brooks and then we'll go to Boo. Yeah, I think um, just uh, being in that moment, especially, you know, throughout the season, because I think we played five or a uh, number of um, overtime games. And like you said, against Purdue and Illinois, really good opponents, just like Florida Atlantic was. So it was really just kind of, you know, staying calm and, you know, uh, just being tough, you know, I think in, uh, in the timeout, we kind of all looked at each other and we were like, you know, we can't lose this game and we're not going to lose this game. And uh, we kind of, you know, told each other that, like, we win close games. So uh, it definitely gives us confidence just being in that situation before. And, uh, you know, we were kind of able to just be ourselves and kind of, you know, take it to another level once we got in that situation. Um, and I think a lot of that comes from being in those situations previously. Boo? Yeah, I mean, Brooks pretty much nailed it on the head, uh, you know, 
obviously, when you get into close games and in our conference, you know, it's close games every, every basically every game, every single year. Uh, and, and usually the better teams are the ones who are able to, you know, come out on top in those last four minutes or, you know, when it matters most. And, you know, we just did a, a great job all year, like you guys said, of just being able to finish out those games. So yesterday going, going into overtime, like Brooks said, man, everybody in the lock, uh, in a uh, huddle from, from the coaches to all the way down to, you know, GAs and managers, you know, everyone's just screaming like, we're going to win. You know, we, got, we just believe in each other. And, you know, th this is what, we're, what we, may, uh, we are made for, and this is what we're built to do. We're going to stay on the same side in row three. Just, just raise your hand real quick. Go ahead. Yeah, for, Boo, for, for those of us who can't quite imagine taking some of the long-range shots you do, uh, could you maybe walk us through, like, how you pick those spots versus how you maybe measure, like, eh, maybe that one's a little too crazy. Like, how do you, what's your shot selection thought process like during the game? Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't really know. I mean, I'm just pretty much thinking about, like, if you, if you go, leave me open, I'm going to shoot it. Uh, but if I'm too far, then I probably won't shoot it. It depends also if I've hit a couple or not. Uh, because if I hit a couple, I might, I'm liable to shoot it from anywhere. But uh, I don't know. My, good, my teammates do a good job of getting me open. And uh, if, if a defender decides to go under or he's a little bit behind and I have space, uh, I'll try to shoot it. But if not, you know, I'll just pass it to, pass it to someone else. We'll stay on this side. We'll go to the aisle on row two. Iggy Dowling inside and you, Brooks, against two bigs like Golden and then now with Donovan Kling and Namara, two guys over seven feet. Um, you're a guy that loves to operate in the post and get to that little eight-footer. Like, how do you get to that spot when you have a big really trying to deny that area? Yeah, it's just kind of uh, knowing where the big is um, and just kind of reading the situation. I remember there was a play yesterday where uh, I was taking my time and uh, backing down whoever was guarding me, and then I saw um, Golden kind of come up and our big Luke did a good job of like kind of getting to the short, um, like the dunker spot on the other side. So it's really just going to be trying to read situations like that, seeing if he's coming up, seeing if I'll be able to get to a fadeaway, or seeing, you know, if they try to force baseline to a big. Not really sure, but uh, it's definitely just going to have to be, you know, making reads. And we always kind of practice that during uh, just practice and simulations that we try to, you know, incorporate. It's all just like making a read and making the right play. And that's hopefully what we'll be able to do tomorrow. Back to the other side of the room in row three. Uh, I don't know if you guys necessarily pay attention to this, but you're one of the heavier underdogs in the second round against UConn. You're also heavy underdogs against UCLA last season, but played a very close game. How does that second round experience from last year help you in another game where, again, you're not favored? Start with Boo, and then we'll go to Brooks. Uh, you could just call us the underdogs. I, I've been here five years. I don't remember a time when we weren't the underdogs. So, I mean, it's nothing new. Uh, we're just going to come out, you know, we're the underdogs. Brooks? Yeah, I think, um, uh, especially for me, just playing in a second round game last year was really my first, you know, tournament experience. And um, kind of like Boo said, like, we know that once we get deeper and deeper into March, we're probably going to be an even more and more underdog. Uh, so, you know, it really doesn't, I mean, it's all kind of, you know, just fun and games with us because, uh, like we kind of like Boo said, we've always been the underdog. But uh, being there last year and kind of realizing that, um, you know, we've been here before is definitely going to be a really good feeling going into the game. Just to know that, like, you know, this isn't, you know, uh, uncommon ground anymore. Any more questions for, we'll come here on this side in row one. Gavin Key from the London Days of Boo. I see you grew up in Albany, or did you grow up there? Is that, and did you, and so you went to Gould Academy in Maine, is that correct? Yeah, I was born and raised in Albany. Okay. Uh, and, then I'm, and then I went to Gould Academy in Maine. I reclassed my junior year of high school, and I did two years at Gould Academy. Did you ever have any connections with Andre Jackson? He went to Albany Academy. Did you have a Yeah, I mean, Andre Jackson, I grew up with him. Uh, he's like a brother to me. Uh, you know, literally since the second grade, we've we've grown up and and been hanging out with each other ever since. And now he's actually in Milwaukee, and I go up about an hour and fifteen minutes, and I go up, uh, you know, like once every other weekend or so. You know, catch a game if I can, or or just go chill with him, say what's up. Has he reached out to you? you knowing you're playing UConn now, to yeah, I mean, he re he reached out to me uh, before the tournament had started, and he was like, you know, uh, 
you got to beat FAU so I can get past and try to make it to the UConn game. So I know that he told me he was going to try to be at the game. Uh, hopefully he can make it. Uh, I'm not sure with, with his schedule, but uh, he definitely had mentioned, mentioned that to me before. Any more questions? Okay, we'll come to this side. We're in row two. Bradley Locker inside on you. Boo, you've guarded a litany of really good guards this year in the Big Ten, and now John L. Davis in the first round. What kind of makes Tristan Newton especially difficult, and what kind of distinguishes his game, in your opinion? Uh, you know, Tristan Newton is, is a good point guard. You know, obviously uh, All-American. All and, uh, you know, I think that he has a good size. Uh, but, you know, we're just – I've played against a lot of, you know, great players, great point guards. So, you know, it's, we're just going to – I'm going to have to come out, take the challenge, and, you know, we're, we're going to see. We'll go to the other side of the room on the end, row three. Yep. Hey, guys. Annie from the Chicago Sun-Times. Um, last year – against UCLA, you guys stayed poised throughout that game, came back, and then ultimately, obviously, we know it, it didn't end the way you wanted it to. But I'm curious how that experience against UCLA um, can maybe benefit you guys now going into this game against um, UConn. We'll do Brooks first and then Boo. Yeah, uh, I think, um, kind of like I said previously, but uh, just the fact that, you know, we've been there in back-to-back uh, -back years, uh, getting there, it's not really on common ground for the program anymore. And it kind of gives, you know, everybody a sense of confidence going into, you know, like um, the fact that we've been there and just the fact that we didn't get it done last year. Um, and uh, Boo had kind of already hit on it. Like, we know that we're a big underdog, but uh, that kind of just makes us, you know, even more confident. You know, we don't really have anything to lose because, you know, we always have been underdogs. So uh, it's definitely, definitely gives us a little experience going into the game. And Boo? <laughs> yeah, I mean, there ain't much more I could add to that. Uh, Brooks said it. You know, I, I think that loss, you know, in the second round to, the, to UCLA is definitely giving us a more determined, uh, more determined mentality, go, you know, going into this second round as well. Do we have any more questions for the student athletes? Okay. You guys are excused. You can head back to the locker room. Northwestern locker room is open. We'll have Coach Collins up here in about four minutes.
All right, we have Northwestern head coach Chris Collins. Once again, if you have questions, we'll start with an opening statement from coach, then we'll go to questions. If you have one, just raise your hand. We'll get a microphone to you. Please give name and affiliation before asking your question. But coach, if you want to start with an opening statement. Yeah, I appreciate everybody coming out. Um, feel fortunate and, and excited to be here today. Um, playing in the NCAA tournament is awesome. Being able to come out with an overtime win last night um, was really proud of our group. Thought we we did a lot of great things against a tremendous team to get to this point. And the last, you know, not 24 hours, but the last 18 hours or so, we've been diving in to get ready for UConn. And um, you know, I've I I have so much admiration for for what Danny's has is doing and has done with that program. Um, the way he runs his program. He and I have known each other forever. I played with Bobby uh, in college. So I've, I've known the Hurley family since I've been 18 years old. And, um, you know, they've been nothing but great to me and recruited some of Danny's guys when he was a high school coach. And he and I have always been very good friends. And I think we, you know, we have a lot of similarities. You know, both of us grew up around basketball. We're coaches, kids. Um, you know, and and have been around the game, so I've I've always enjoyed kind of talking to him. Uh, I think we've had similar upbringings, and um, you kind of coach in similar manners. So to have an opportunity to compete against this program and against his team, which to me has been as good as any, not you know over the past couple of years in the country, is going to be a great honor and and definitely a, a challenge that is going to be tough for us, but one I think our guys are excited about seeing what we can do. All right, we'll start right here in the front row on this side of the room. Hey, Chris. Um, going back to when you were recruiting Ryan, what was your message to him about playing his fifth year with North, Northwestern? And um, in this moment specifically, how much is his experience combined with the experience of Boo um, and, and everybody else that played against UCLA last year valuable? Well, I think when we were recruiting Ryan, um, you know, there was a great opportunity for him to jump into a key role on a team that we felt could be really good. You know, we, when you're a grad transfer, a lot, you, you want to play with other older guys. You know, you have one year left. It's not this, you're not a part of this multi year rebuild. You got one year to play. You want to be on a winning team. You want to have a big role and you want to be around guys that you fit in with. And I thought we checked the box of all those things. We had a huge need for what he brought, um, his ability to shoot and make plays at the guard position, his experience playing in the NCAA tournament. And we told him, we felt like if he joined, that we would be back. And I know that was something that was important to him. Um, uh, it was to be able to, and then when he came, he just fits so well with our guys. And his experience last year, I think you saw it last night. I mean, I, I don't know, after having the first half that he and the rest of our team had, we couldn't throw it in the ocean. But he played in three NCAA tournament games last year. He kind of understood the moment, understood the situation. He stayed with it. He kept being aggressive, kept taking his shots. And, and then obviously he got really hot in the second half in overtime. So I think that's where you saw the experience really come out. We're going to stay on that same side, row four. Yeah, go ahead. Chris, uh, when you played, how did Coach K address and handle complacency? Um, Coach was always so good mentally with our teams. You know, I, I thought um, he was as good as it got with, with always creating motivation, you know, day to day, not year to year motivation, but daily motivation. You know, w ways to keep our teams on their toes, ways to make sure that guys weren't in a position to ever get complacent about anything, especially if they had won a lot. You know, we had been on winning streaks, championships, whatever it may be. He, he had an amazing ability for, because of his fire and his competitive nature to really draw that in to us as players, where you know the moment you you relax for one second, he was he was going to be all over that and make sure that we got back to being you know the team we needed to be. And and it was something that I really learned from him. I was with him four years as a player, thirteen as a coach, so seventeen years of my life you know being around his leadership and his team building skills and his ability to motivate you know there there's probably not a day that goes by that something that I do doesn't relate to something he did with one of our players you know at duke in uh, in terms of motivating or building teams i'm I'm always drawn upon those experiences and what with what I'm doing in Northwestern. We'll go to the other side of the room we're in row two right now. Hey, Coach David Gold, inside on you. Throughout the year, especially when you play big guys like Zach Eady, you talked a lot about employing all 15 fouls you had with your big men. Do you plan on a similar strategy going into Klingon tomorrow? And if so, 
with Matt Al Where do those extra five fouls come from? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't – I think we have to be a little bit smarter. You know, I mean, it's uh, – uh, we don't have the bodies and the depth to be able to say just take a bunch of fouls on him. Um, we have to be smart. We have to use our bodies. We have to be physical. Um, you know, I think what makes this team so dangerous, though, is – Klingon is a great, great player, but all of a sudden, if you sell everything out on trying to take him away, you're going to get killed by the rest of the team. They have so much balance. I mean, five guys averaging in double figures, you know, multi, multiple guys who can shoot, multiple guys who can play and pick and roll, make plays. They're very unselfish. So, I mean, that's what makes them so good is you can't really just say we're going to stop one guy. And we have to do a good job against Klingon. we got to make sure our body's on him at all times, take away his, his ability to roll as a lob threat. And then when he does get it into the paint, we have to be really in, in tune with our, with our doubling schemes and rotations because they, they got other great players as well that can burn you. We'll stay in this row two and then stay with row two. Go ahead. Coach Bradley Locker inside, and you, when Rick Pitino was asked about playing UConn, I don't know if you saw the quote, he said you know, six of their players got COVID. It's, I don't know, what, what kind of goes into preparing for a team like this, and do you think something similar needs to happen for you guys to have a chance out there? Um, I'm not going to say that. I mean, if look, they're the best team in the country. They've earned that. You know, are they, Do they have more talent top to bottom than us? Probably so. But I think what's beautiful about the, the, the NCAA tournament is it's one game. You know, if we had to play them in a best of seven, we're not going to win a series. That's just the reality. You know, they're the better team across the board. But that doesn't mean on one night you can't put it together. I mean, that's what's great about basketball. You know, can we on one night put 40 minutes together where we're really dialed in, where we can execute, where we can make some shots, where we can somewhat slow down, you know, their juggernaut offensively? Um, you know, that's, that's the challenge, one game, you know, and, and our guys are excited about that opportunity. I, I hope playing in our league, you know, we played Purdue twice, we played Illinois twice, you know, we played, and I'm not saying those teams are UConn, but they're, they're teams that people feel can be national championship contenders and final, and, and we won two of those four games. So, you know, our, guy, our guys, they, they're relishing the opportunity. They, they, we have great respect for UConn, um, but we're, we're going to compete. You know, we're, we're going to come and we're going to compete. We're going to try to be us. We're going to be confident. We're going to do what we do. And, and let's see what happens tomorrow night. We're going to stay in row two, then we'll go back over the other side of the room. Right here, row two. Yeah, you shared a while, Jerry. You know, and Coach, you kind of mentioned Purdue just now, but having beaten Purdue, a number one team in Purdue in back-to-back -back seasons, how does that give you sort of added confidence as you prepare for another number one team in UConn? Yeah, I mean, I think playing really good teams, um, you know, our, our guys, we've played in tough venues. We've played great teams. Again, UConn is as good as any of them. I mean, arguably, they're the best team in the country. I mean, I, I've watched them from afar. I, I marvel at the, the team they've had and how they play together and how tough they are and competitive and they show up every night. And their balance, like I said, their balance is, is really something um, to admire. Um, but again, playing a Big Ten schedule, um, we played all the best teams in our league two times. You know, all the teams that played in the tournament this year, we played them all twice. So um, we've played really good teams. We've played great opponents. And you can't worry about that. I mean, this is one game. Like, you, you have to go out there and just play. You, you got to compete. You can't – if you're on your heels because of who UConn is, then we have no chance. And, and that's not the attitude we have to take. We have to come in believe, believing we can compete, believing that we can win. Like I said, in one game, it's not, it's not the NBA. It's not a seven-game series. It's one game. You know, can we put it together for 40 minutes and give ourselves a chance to get late in the game and, and have a chance to, to win it? We'll go to the other side of the room in row three. Coach, uh, Matt Sheldon, Wildcat Report. Um, this is the third time in your career you've been in the situation of playing a top two seed on short prep. How do those past experiences against UCLA and Gonzaga help shape your preparation for this game? Yeah, I think any time you can get experience in anything, it's helpful. You know, and I, I think for our guys, a lot of our key guys went through last year where we won a tough game against Boise State and then had to turn around and play UCLA, you know, 48 hours later. Um, so they're kind of familiar with how the timing works. 
Um, you know, playing in the evening hopefully will help. It's a little bit more prep time. You know, we will have all day today. We'll have an opportunity tomorrow to do a little bit more prep and walk through. And at the end of the day, though, this time of year, you know, I think you got to be careful to over coaching and over preparing. You know, I think you got to stay true to who you are, your principles, what you do well. Um, if you, I, I think like if you overload your guys with too much information, um, it can paralyze them a little bit. You know, and it can it can get them on their heels and a step slower. We we have to be us. You know, we got to do what we do. We we got to try to do it at maybe the highest level we've done it all year long. Um, our defense has to be on point. Um, this is a team that scores a lot of points and they go on runs. They're so explosive. So I think our ability to 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 not allow them go on the 18 to two run. You know, the 20 to four run. You know, that's when they get away from people and then. You know the game, for all intents and purposes, gets away from you. So we gotta we gotta stay within arm's distance and and try to stem their runs. And to do that, you gotta defend, and then you gotta score. We're gonna have to find enough offense. I've said this, you guys, some of you guys who follow us um, in our league, like the Illinois and the Purdue's. You know those games that we won, we scored a lot of points. Like this team is so prolific offensively. Offensively, like you're not gonna hold them to 50 points. You know, they're, they're going to score. So, I mean, we're going to have to find a way offensively. Like, we're not – you know, we got away with it yesterday. We only had 19 at half. Like, that, that's not going to work. Like, we're going to have to uh, make shots. We're going to have to execute. We're going to have to put the ball in the hole a little bit if we're going to have to – if we're going to want to give ourselves a chance tomorrow night. Okay, we're back on this side of the room in the last row. Just raise your hand so Coach knows. Go ahead. Coach Mike Fitzpatrick from AP. Uh, you mentioned UConn's balance. You know, all, all of us can see – you know some of their attributes that they have, their size, their speed, their some very accurate long-range shooters, their ability in transition. But there's a lot of talented teams that have not been as consistent and overpowering as they've been for the last all season and going mm -hmm. back to the tournament. Sure. What is it about them that maybe only you know that a coach would only a coach can see that that makes them like that? Not just a talented team that you know is up and down here and there, but is you know night after night is on point. Well, I, I think really it's a direct result of them following the personality of their coach. You know, really that's who Danny is. You know, Danny has done an amazing job, you know, getting those a, a talented group, a collection of guys to really buy in to each other, you know, to play as a team, to be unselfish, to not really care who scores, to move the ball, find the right shots. You know, it's very apparent, you know, they're a very together group and they're a tough competitive group. You know, and when I say say those characteristics, you think of their coach. So, I mean, I, I think that Danny sets the tone with that, his leadership, uh, his ability to mold his program and his personality um, is really impressive. And, you know, I think his players are just an extension, extension of who he is. You know, and that's probably the best way I can describe it. We'll go down. We'll start on the aisle here in row three. Hey, Chris, Mike Crispino, UConn Sports Network. Uh, getting back to the, the sons of coaches like you are, how much do you talk to your dad about this stuff? Do you, do you talk daily? Do you talk specifics? <laughs> what are those conversations like? Yeah, I mean, we look, our whole lives we talked, you know, and, and we've shared a love of ball. I mean, I've been in the gym since I've been two years old, and I could walk and stand tagging along same way Danny has. I mean, where we have such a great friendship through our love of basketball. I mean, we have our father-son relationship, but, you know, we're always talking about the game, you know, or, and other games. And, you know, do you see this? Do you see that? I think the one thing my dad has done a great job for me is he doesn't really focus on X's and O's stuff. He focuses on the big picture. You know, for him, he, he was able to coach four NBA teams and all the all the situations he took over, they were they were not great situations when he took them over. Kind of similar to what I took over at Northwestern. So it was more, okay, how do you build a winning culture? How do you build a winning mindset? You know, the the psychological things with your players. How do I get the most out of this guy? What do you need to do? He's been such a great resource with that, um, and he's like the grandfatherly figure to my team. You know, it's awesome. He, you know, my dad's been in the the game for almost 50 years in the NBA as a player, played in the Olympics as a coach, coaching Jordan, you know, all the experiences that he's had a chance, lead broadcaster for so many years. 
it's so awesome for me. One of my favorite times is when he comes to a practice and watches and he kind of just lets it all settle. And then when practice is over, our guys go and huddle around him and he just is holding court, you know, with his basketball experiences. And that's really cool for me to, to be able to share that with him. And um, we've had such an amazing relationship through the game our whole lives. And it's special to have him be able to come to my games and, and watch my teams compete. We'll come up here on this side in row two. Coach, you saw Cam Spencer twice last year when he was at Rutgers. Maybe not turning back on that tape, but how much you reference what you guys did against him when he was in New Jersey to maybe attack him tomorrow, although I know the systems are different now that he's with Dan Storrs. Yeah, I mean, I love Cam. I mean, he uh, you guys know, I mean, I love the Spencer family. You know, we, we gave Pat an opportunity right off the lacrosse field, you know, when no one else would. You know, we just – because of the mindset, I mean, I just love how both of those guys are wired. They're just tough, competitive, confident guys that that work hard. And Cam has become a terrific player, man. I mean, he starting out at Loyola, going to Rutgers, what he did there, now coming here to the biggest stage at UConn and what he's done. He's He gives them an edge. You know, I think the one thing about him that's really good, you know, he wasn't a part of that team last year. So there's a hunger with him to want to win it. You know, because he didn't get a chance to taste that, the Final Four and the championship. And I think he's given them a little bit of an edge with his personality and his confidence. He, he's a terrific shooter, very smart player. I think underrated with the ball, you know, good passer, you know, plays within himself. And as, now that he's playing with the talent base, he's, you know, he becomes even more dangerous because you can't really load up on him either, you know. But you have to do a great job of understanding the things he does really well. You got to get into his airspace. You can't give him catch and shoot threes, and then you can't overrun it too because he's the ability to get in the paint and find find uh, find shooters and make plays for others as well. We'll stay in row up on that. Um, Pat Spencer made his NBA debut a couple weeks ago. What I mean for you as a coach, you took a chance <laughs> on him to see him now playing in the big leagues. It's awesome, man. Uh, I'm so proud of Pat. You know, we talk all the time. Um, we were actually texting a little bit yesterday. I know he's mad that the brackets shook out the way they did you know where we we got to play against his brother you know he he was with us for one year but his impact was huge especially on boo you know boo was a freshman when pat was with us and i thought pat did a great job kind of showing boo the ropes of what it takes to be a great athlete at the college level and the mentality and the mindset you have to have and now to see pat like he only played one year of organized ball in college with us and now to see him a, three years later be on an nba roster I mean, what an incredible testament to his work and what an athlete, right? I mean, that's that's just an incredible story. Couldn't be more proud of what he's doing, although I thought his dunk was kind of weak. The other night I told him, I said, you're more athletic than that. You should have, like, windmilled it or something. And he told me he'd been sitting on the floor for two and a half hours, so he's a little stiff. Last two questions will come in row two here. Bradley Locker inside and you have coach I believe UConn has lost three of his last 41 games kind of a staggering mark but how much will you go back and watch those three contests just to kind of see what has worked for other teams in defeating UConn yeah I think what you try to do as a staff is you get as much information as you can I mean we were all in on our Florida, Florida Atlantic prep at least I was and you know that's why you have a staff we've had other guys that have been working on UConn in case this came to fruition so you know we had a long edit last night we watched a number of games you know, talked about a lot of ideas. Like I said, you, you got to be really careful to make sure, okay, what are some things that might hurt them or might work without deviating too much with what we do because you only have one day prep. So I think that's kind of the challenge. But certainly you, you want to look at teams that have had a little bit of success. Is there any common thread to that? Um, you know, 38 and three though, it's a pretty good record. So, I mean, there haven't been a lot of teams that have had a lot of success and uh, that's going to be our challenge tomorrow. And final question here in row two. Hey, Coach, Jake Epstein, the Daily Northwestern. How have you seen guys like Nick Martinelli and Luke Hunger be able to step in and embrace this next man up mentality where they're able to play starters, starters minutes on a March Madness team? Yeah, I just think it's the culture of what our program has become. You know, it's, it's something that I'm really proud about. Um, you know, it's, we have a belief that now whoever puts the jersey on that we're going to win. We're going to figure it out. I mean, I was... You know, all those guys, when we got it to overtime, you guys would, in the huddle, I mean, our, our guys just said, we're not losing. You know, we're, we're winning this game. And, and they meant it. You know, sometimes that's, you're just speaking out loud, but you could see it in their eyes. And for those two guys in particular, Nick, once we lost Ty Berry to go from a 15 to 19 a game minute guy to now almost playing the whole game, 
and having more expectation on him to score and defend and do the things as a young player. Same thing with Luke. He redshirted last year with a broken foot. So he's really a freshman, you know. So now all of a sudden you're starting center your freshman year, uh, playing at the bi on the biggest stage against the best players. You know, for him to come out yesterday and get eight points, eight rebounds, four assists, make a couple, make some big free throws. Just really proud of those guys. And it's also a testament to our veteran leadership because I think those guys, they give those guys the confidence they need. When you're out there with older guys that are, that are pumping you up and giving you confidence, I think that there's nothing like that. And that's what our older guys have done for those guys. All right, Coach. Thank you, Thanks guys. Thanks for taking the time. We'll Appreciate see you tomorrow. It. All right, see you, man. Okay, see you, Chris. We think Cam will show today. He didn't come last time. What's that? We're only bringing two? Okay. Yeah, okay. We got them all up here.
Uh, we'll get started. I think Stefan and Donovan are still to come. But we have Cam up here. We have Alex. We have Tristan. Uh, once again, just raise your hand if you want to ask a question. We'll get a microphone to you. Please give name and affiliation before asking your question. But we'll, we'll get into it. We'll start here on this side, row four. Go ahead. Uh, guys, all of the above. Steve Serby, New York Post. How does Coach Hurley impress upon you guys not, how does he get rid of complacency? What does he say and what does he do? Let's start with Cam, then we'll go to Alex, then Tristan. Yeah, I would say it's a lot through film study and stuff, you know. Um, he talks a lot about, you know, holding ourselves to a standard and, you know, playing a full 40 minutes. Um, and we're never perfect in a basketball game. There's, there's always ways to get better. So I think just going through all the, those little things that we can do to, to be at our best or, is a way to fight that. Yeah, what Cam said, I think um, Coach Hurley always holds us to the UConn standard that's established here throughout the years and that um, it's important for us to get better every day. Every practice we got to get better and every game we got to get better. So if we're not living up to the expectation that he holds us to, then he'll let us know. So um, but really it's just continuing to get better every day is what's important for him. Yeah, like they said, um, just getting better and holding us to a standard. You know, um, everybody's trying to win, so uh, we haven't really done much yet, you know, the, the ultimate goal of this tournament is to win the whole thing. And, um, you know, the Big East, and, and it was cool and all, but um, can't get complacent and, and stop there. We're trying to go for a historic thing. So um, if we're complacent, that's, that's not going to help us achieve what we want to achieve. Come up here on this side of the room on the aisle, row two. David Gold, Inside the You. Cam, you squared off with Northwestern twice last year. What have you seen from the Cats when you play them and now on tape, and how much have you tried to bring what you learned to your team for this game tomorrow? Yeah, I think uh, obviously a different team from last year, but they bring back a lot of the big pieces that they had. Um, you know, I think they're a physical team. You know, they, they take pride in their defense and, and how hard they play. Um, so obviously we'll have, we'll have to bring our A game, and um, you know, we'll be ready. We'll come over here on the other side of the room in row one. Joe Ruta, Hartford Current. Alex, so what was, the last, what was last night like for you guys in terms of preparation? What did you do sort of when you went back to the hotel and everything? Um, and what are your first impressions on this Northwestern team? Yeah, when we got back to the hotel, we just started doing um, recovery right away and um, just recovered our bodies, rest, ate, and then um, it was straight into film. We started watching Northwestern film, and then we started watching um, – you know, film from the Stetson game and what we could have done better and what we did, you know, right during that game. And then Northwestern, I mean, Cam said they're a really good team. Their guards are unbelievable. Just their surrounding pieces are unbelievable. And their defense is really good. So, um, you know, we got to be ready to play. They have All-American point guard and Boo Booey. And then a Langboard who played really well last night, too. So, um, I mean, they're, they're a really good team. Okay, we have Stefan and Donovan up here as well now. Uh, locker room is open. Uh, until 3 o'clock, I believe. But we will stay here for a little while if you have questions. We stand on that side in row two at the end. Go ahead. Uh, this is Gavin Key from the London Day. Uh, Alex, uh, this, this tournament run, how does it feel different from last year? Once you go through that experience of winning a national championship and you're, you're going back into the tournament, how does it feel different? Yeah, I think uh, we know, the returner guys especially, we know what this tournament is and we know what's expected from this tournament. So we've been through the experience of the tournament run last year. We're just trying to, you know, pass on our knowledge to the new guys this year. And, um, but more importantly, we're just trying to do this whole run again with a new guy, with new guys. And um, we know how it felt when in it last year. We just want to experience that again. So, uh, but we know we just got to take it day by day and just stay with the process. And um well, it's always an exciting tournament. It's the best tournament in the country, and um, it's the best tournament all year. So we're just super excited about it. We're going to come to this side of the room in the back. Just raise your hand so the guys can see. Go ahead. Uh, was, uh, Mike Fitzpatrick from AP. Uh, this question for Donovan in particular because you grew up in, in Bristol. Um, I know you guys are entirely focused on what you're doing, but um, Yale is having a nice run uh, also. Obviously, they had an exciting um, win in the Ivy League and had a big win <coughs> um, yesterday. And, just wondering uh, if, if you followed Yale as well much growing up and if you have any like a fun um, or anything interesting, you know, folks back home who are, you know, who pull for both teams or have talked about the, the prospect of you. I'm not asking you to get ahead of yourself, but the, the prospect of you guys playing each other in the, in the next round. Um, I mean, 
I'm, I was always a UConn fan growing up. I really, know, I mean, I would watch Yale. I mean, just growing up, you know, they're a good program and stuff. But I mean, really, it's just growing up as a UConn fan and watching UConn. And um, I mean, it's it's cool to see another school from the area, you know, do well. We'll stay in the same section, one row up. Jamal Murphy, Bill Rodney on Sports. Uh, Tristan, you've been, you know, you've been putting up numbers and and playing really well for two years now. Even your coach says you you still kind of fly under the radar. Why why do you think you're a little underrated? Um, I mean, I guess the guys around me, you know, I mean, it's it's not like I'm I'm the only player on the team, uh, you know. Everybody else, you know, we got two two lottery picks and you know um, two other NBA prospects on the team. So uh, I'm not the only one on the team. The the whole team is is getting the recognition it deserves. We're the number one team in the nation, and uh, a lot of people, including ourselves, think we're the best team in the nation. And that's really the important thing about um, you know basketball is, is team success. So uh, I'm not really worried about you know what others think about myself in particular. As long as we go out there. Uh, you know, play well and win games. That's that's really the important thing to me right now. We'll come up on the same side on the aisle in row two. Next two questions will be in row two here. Uh, David Golden's line here. Donovan with Matt Nicholson out. Northwestern is down just to two big men. Is there an emphasis in the game plan for tomorrow to run the offense through you and try to get those big men in foul trouble and really just take advantage of the size advantage throughout this game? Um, I mean, obviously, you know, they have, like you said, their biggest hurt, um, you know, so obviously I'm going to do my best, try to dominate my opponent, dominate my matchup, and, you know, really just haven't talked about, we really didn't talk about, you know, running the offense through me. We're just going to play our game like we usually do, run, on, run our offense like we do. You know, coach is going to put us in the right and best positions to succeed at a high level, and, um, you know, we're to let the game flow. But I know going into this game, I, you know, my team needs me to dominate my matchup. Stay in row two. Go ahead. Bradley Locker inside, and you guys have gone 38 and three in your last 41 games. Just kind of, what does that number mean to you? That only three losses of 41. And what do you think has kind of been the key to avoiding offsets, especially in a tournament like this? Is this for anyone specific or the group? General. We'll start with. Uh, why don't we do the guys that have been a part of most of it? Um, Alex, then Tristan, then Donovan. Yeah, I think it's been an impressive record for us so far, and uh, we're proud of the record going 33 and three right now. But. We have so much more and that um, we've learned a lot throughout those three losses and um, you know those losses really helped shape us into the team we are today and just looking back on those experiences have really helped us make, become a better team so really we wouldn't be where we are without those losses and um, you know we know what to do if we want to avoid those losses. Tristan? Uh, yeah I agree. Um, every, every game even wins and losses we learn something new about ourselves and um, we know what to build on and, and what to do to to get more wins, so um, you know th those wins really helped us, and those losses really helped us, and we're just you know trying to improve on that record and and take it a little farther. And Donovan? Yeah, I mean I feel like we learned a lot throughout you know this this streak. Um, you know different different type of games to play, um, different type of atmospheres. Uh, you know, but it's really just sticking to the script, you know, focused on the next game. Don't get too far ahead of yourselves. You know, don't be complacent where you're at and just keep focusing on, you know, your next opponent. We'll go to the other side of the room, end of row two. Just raise your hand so the guys know. Go ahead. This is for Steph, Gavin Keith from the London Day. You, you've got some really tough guards this year, and, you know, Northwestern obviously has a tough guard. What, what's been your mindset as far as defensively this season? Um, just – just really buying into what the coach asked me to do, you know, uh, just knowing what my abilities are and knowing that I'm capable of it. So just really just trying to lock into it and, um, you know, just really getting the confidence from my teammates. You know, uh, they really believe in me with the assignment, so I'm just trying to embrace it. Stay on that same side in row four near the aisle. Go ahead. For the three guys who were part of it last year, how is it possible? What enables you guys to be as hungry now as you were a year ago? Let's start same order as before, Alex, then Tristan, then Donovan. Yeah, we're just as hungry because we want to experience that feeling of winning again, but more importantly, we want to experience it with the new guys too because they haven't felt what it feels like to win a national championship. So, I mean, just doing this journey again with the new guys is special, and that's what continues to get us going every day. And uh, just continue to add the UConn's history of, you know, possibly winning number six for the program is something special. Yeah, I would agree. You know, like, like he said, we're trying to make history. And, you know, the, the feeling of winning is the best uh, feeling that, that we could get as a team. And like he said, the, the, the new guys that 
our first years into the program, they haven't experienced what uh, the national championship is like. And, you know, we want to, them to experience that feeling because it's, a, it's an unbelievable feeling that you'll never forget. And uh, we want to experience it with this group. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, they said most of it, but, you know, if you want to be great, if you want to, you know, make it to the highest level, you want to just, you want to keep, you know, wanting success, you want to keep winning. Um, you know, winning is the best feeling that you could, you know, experience through the sport. Um, and, you know, like they said, really just, you know, with the, all these new guys, the young guys, just trying to have them be a part of history and, you know, get them to, you know, feel that championship feeling. Coming back to this side of the room in row four. Just raise your hand so the guys can see it. Go ahead. Uh, Steph, I mean, this has been talked about before, five-star coming in to a, you know, a ready-made team. Um, but what, what was your mentality? What, what allowed you to just, to just fit in like that when, you know, most, a lot of five-stars, they kind of want to make a name for themselves right away. They don't have the patience. But is that something in your personality? Was it the, was it the coach or the team that, that helped you embrace that? Uh, I would say it's definitely my teammates, you know, just being around them since day one. You can kind of, you can kind of sense the culture, you know, it's not really a, you know, it's not really a selfish culture. So it really wasn't for me to, you know, come in and really think of my own stats or think of, you know, how well I played. It was just, you know, it was doing whatever I can to come in and, and help the team win. And I feel like everybody else had the same kind of approach. So, I mean, if, if you stand out and try and, you know, be selfish, I mean, you'll stand out for the wrong reason. So. Do we have any? Come back here on row two on the aisle. Cam, your brother Pat played his lone college basketball season at Northwestern. Have you had any conversations with him leading up to this game, and did he tell you where his allegiances lie uh, for tomorrow's matchup? Mm -hmm. uh, I have talked to him. Yeah, we, we haven't talked too much about Northwestern, but obviously it's uh, coming full circle to, to play them in, in the tournament. Um, but, you know, he, we were really appreciative of you know his one year at Northwestern and. Um, you know, he, I know he'll be watching from uh, California, but yeah, I think he's rooting for UConn tomorrow. We'll stay on the same side at the other end of row two. Go ahead. Noah Keaton, UConn student television. Steph, coming in as a freshman, can you just touch on the impact that coach has had on you, you know, looking towards the next level and you starting? Um, you know, it's, it's had a big impact on my confidence, you know, just, you know, knowing that, I mean, he believes in me to make an impact for our team and the assignments that, that he's asked me to, uh, you know, to, to play and the role he's asked me to play. I mean, as a freshman, I, I feel like that's, that's big time and it, it, gives you a lot of, it gives you a lot of confidence going into games like this. And we'll stay at that same end in row three. I'm Avery Becker, UC TV Sports. Cam, um, a lot of people have compared your fire during the game to your coach, Dan Hurley. Can you just talk about what kind of mentor he's been to you this year? Yeah, he's been the best. Um, you know, we're very similar people, very like-minded. Um, you know, I think a lot of that was kind of how we were raised with older brothers and, you know, dad who pushed us to, to be at our best. Um, but, you know, I can't say enough great things about him. You know, I'd, I'd go to war for him any day of the week, and I think we all would. We really just appreciate him as a coach. Go to the other side of the room. We're on the aisle in row five. Uh, Herbert Delancey, BSTM. For the players, how great is it to have, I mean, the neighboring state of Connecticut, uh, how great is it to have your fans come down here to New York and to Brooklyn to, and to cheer on the Husky, um, the Husky program. Why don't we have Cam, then Alex, then Tristan answer that. Yeah, I think it's huge. You know, one of our goals was to be able to get the one seed and to be in Brooklyn because we knew that would be a competitive advantage for us to have our fans be able to come to the neighboring state. Um, and, you know, I think they've been great for us all year. And, you know, I think that's just a, a big advantage that we have in, in this tournament. Yeah, like Cam said, it's a huge advantage for us. And we'll definitely need their support tomorrow because we know Northwestern, they had a great crowd yesterday. And, um, you know, they have a great fan base as well. So it'll definitely be a, a huge advantage for us. And we look forward to hearing the UConn chants tomorrow. Yeah, I mean, uh, UConn, UConn Nation, they always travel well. And, you know, they, they give us a good boost of energy that we need to go out there and compete for, you know, the games that we play in. So it's a, it's a good advantage. And um, we're going to need them tomorrow night. Any more questions for the student athletes? A reminder, the locker room is open as well. OK, you guys are dismissed. Thanks. We'll see you tomorrow.
Okay, we have UConn head coach Dan Hurley coming to the podium here in just a second. Okay, we have UConn head coach Dan Hurley up on the podium. We'll start with an opening statement from coach, then we'll go to questions. Once again, just raise your hand. We'll get a microphone to you, give name and affiliation before asking your question. But coach, if you want to start. Yeah, obviously excited to, uh, you know, to advance and uh, you know, get a chance to uh, you know, play uh, you know, an outstanding Northwestern team, you know, great coach. Uh, you know, and Chris, who I got a, you know, as much respect for him as anyone you know, in, in our profession. So, uh, you know, excited, you know, to get in here uh, tomorrow night, uh, you know, maybe, you know, to have a, a great, you know, UConn, hopefully, a, you know, a, a, a big UConn crowd in here tomorrow night, um, but excited to uh, advance and play. We'll go on this side of the room in row four, close to the aisle. Um, What's up, Steve? How did your father address complacency, and have you studied other great coaches and as to how they handled complacency? Yeah, um, yeah my dad, obviously, you know, he, 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 um, you know, he handled complacency with a constant intensity uh, and a consistent intensity, um, and he modeled uh, just a work ethic um, and a commitment of just pouring everything that he had of himself into his, uh, you know, into his job uh, or into his, you know, his lifestyle and, and uh, as, as a coach. And I think that's what you, you know, you, you see from, from every coach, uh, or at least the best ones, is that, you know, you, you could tell that they're emotionally, physically, you know, mentally, they poured everything they have into their team, their preparation, uh, rooting out, uh, you know, any types of behaviors or habits that they believe could potentially undermine, uh, you know, the success of an organization or the championship success of an organization. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I read. I'm, 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 a, I'm constantly listening to podcasts and, and reading about great leaders, uh, you know, and, 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 you know, the, the Nick Sabans, the, you know, the, you know, the, 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 the greatest coaches, the John Woodens, uh, the Bill Parcells, Bill Belichick, uh, anything that I could read or, or, or listen to or, or, or go and visit and watch. Yes, I'm superstitious. I need my lucky hat. Good hustle, Chris. Uh, we'll go to the other side of the room, row four on the end. Go ahead. Just raise your hand so Coach knows where you are. Zach Brazil, New York Post. What's up, Dan? What's up, Zach? Uh, Hassan was obviously a big recruit coming out of high school um, and didn't quite live up to the expectations at A&M. What, what did you guys see out of him that made you think he would be good for you, and what has he kind of meant to you this year? I think we, we, we were torn. You know, we, we, uh, we had a lot of guards uh, when he was coming out of high school, but we kind of felt like we might have been making a mistake by not recruiting him. And, you know, he ended, uh, you know, we went in the, in, when he went in the portal and we looked at the end of his sophomore year there, he had a great stretch in the NIT. Um, so he played his best basketball late. And we just felt like, uh, you know, Big East guard-wise, he fit the mold. Uh, junkyard dog defensively. Um, you know, a guy with, you know, with, with a lot of guts and a lot of heart and a lot of swagger. And, um, you know, it was a guy that, you know, performed at a high level in grassroots throughout, so the pedigree was there. But I just think, you know, it, it takes a special type of guy to play or, or coach at UConn um, because, you know, there's pressure all the time. And, and you know, so we knew we had a guy with the, uh, with the stomach for it. Can we stay at his gonna, role? Yep. Can I follow up? Yeah, yeah, no, I was telling him to His role has obviously expanded this year with, with uh, Nagon. Um, what has he meant to you guys this year? And what does it say about a guy who, was such a big recruit that he's, 
you know, able to, buy, you know, play that role? Yeah. Um, th that was the, the question, biggest question mark about this team coming in. I think uh, you could see what the starters look like. Um, that wasn't too hard to project, but um, the unknown would, would be the depth part. And, uh, you know, could we get to, to eight deep, nine deep with quality, um, you know, to keep us bulletproof? Uh, and, you know, we wouldn't be where we are without how he's played for us, without Samson Johnson, the emergence of Jalen Stewart, and then what Solo Ball's done for us throughout the year. So um, just being able to go eight or nine deep with quality, just uh, you're able to survive, a, you know, a bad night from, from some of your better players because of that depth. We'll stay on this side. We'll come on the aisle in row two. Coach, uh, David Gold inside on you. Northwestern's missing its starting center, Matt Nicholson, playing a redshirt freshman, Luke Hunger, now starting his five. Is there an added emphasis in your game plan tomorrow to get the ball down low to Domin and use those size advantage to his matchup with the starting five out for the Wildcats? Yeah. Um, you know, obviously, that, that's something that in some way that you, you hope you can, you, know, you, you can take advantage of. They do a great job of, of scheming from a defensive standpoint. Uh, you know, with their post traps, um, you know, in the way that they rally to the ball uh, in the paint. You know, they're a tremendous, uh, tremendous help team. They're very, very physical. Um, you know, Chris is one of the, you know, one of the, one of the best pure, you know, tactical coaches in the game. You know, Chris and his staff at both ends of the court. So, um, you know, a lot of those things, you know, they're, uh, you know, we, we, we may both go into the game feeling like it's an advantage, obviously. You know, they're going to be prepared for us to, to try to go inside with the basketball. We'll go to the other side of the room in row three. Just raise your hand so Coach can see it. Go ahead. Yeah, Ayusha Gawal, Jerry Northwestern. Uh, Coach, Northwestern has beaten a number one team in Purdue in back-to-back -back seasons. What, if, if anything at all, have you taken from those games as you're preparing for the same team tomorrow? Yeah, just the level, um, you know, the, the level that, that, that Chris has got his, his, his program at, uh, you know, where, where they're, you know, they could beat the best teams in the country, you know, at, at Northwestern, a program that I guess hadn't been to the NCAA tournament in an incredibly long time. And now, uh, you know, they're as dangerous an opponent as you could face uh, at this point in the tournament because they've shown the ability to beat the high-end teams. Um, you know, with what they have on the perimeter, Boo Booey, one of the best guards in the country, all-American caliber player. Um, you know, would be an easy Big Ten Player of the Year if it wasn't for a Zach Eady. Um, obviously, uh, Langborg, who you know lit it up last March, and then his performance yesterday was was tremendous. Um, you know, and then Barnheiser, uh, you know, is a, is a tremendous player. They got three guys that can go for 20 plus, and uh, you know, you win in this tournament, you know, with tremendous perimeter play. We'll go to the other side. We're in row four. Just go ahead, Jeff. Jamal Murphy, Bill Road, Bill Road No Sports. Um, about Tristan, and, you, and you've mentioned a bunch of times you can't believe how underrated he is. He's gotten some college basketball accolades. You don't see him on draft boards. I'm wondering why you think he's, he's underrated, but, and also, do you think real NBA guys know when, so when that time comes, he'll, yeah. he'll have that career? Bill Roden's the best. Um, it's Tristan, I think that... Um, yeah, I think a lot of mock drafts right now, um, you know, in particular, I think uh, a lot of those are manipulated. A lot of those will change by the time we get closer um, to the draft. And then the actual draft is going to look different because you know, there's a lot, obviously a lot of agents that are you know, jockeying for their clients uh, so that they don't lose clients right now because they're not showing up in the mock drafts. They put a lot of pressure on the folks that put those out there. Um, the analytics people, I know, you know, when you look at you know, most efficient players in the country, um, you know, I think Tristan ends up somewhere top five in, in a lot of things in terms of his impact. And I think, uh, you know, these front offices, are, a lot of it is analytics-based. I think a lot of teams value him a lot more than these mock drafts do. Um, you know, he's a first-team All-American. Um, you know, he's a guy that obviously was up for Big East Player of the Year, didn't get it, uh, or at least didn't get, get it from the coaches, got it from AP. Um, but yeah, he's got he's six five. He rebounds. He he, uh, he facilitates play makes. Uh, he you know he shoots NBA threes uh, with pretty good efficiency, and he's a champion. I, I think he's going to play in the NBA for twelve to fifteen years. We'll stay on this side at the end, row one. 
Wayne Norman, UConn Sports Network. Dan, your bench was such a key factor in postseason last year. The last three games, Jalen Stewart has really emerged. Can you talk about what that means to your bench, how deep your bench has become, and the confidence that he's gotten in these last three games? Yeah, that just getting, um, you know, getting to eight deep and, uh, you know, and, and all three guys, you know, bringing, bringing quality, offensive impact, defensive impact. You know, with Jalen, he brings six, seven, athleticism and length, multi-positional versatility. Um, you know, for him, he's, uh, you know, he's come on late and um, you know, he, he's, he's added like to that kind of big wing, three, four matchup problem spot, which is what everyone's looking for in the sport. Uh, you know, he's a guy with, uh, obviously he's gonna help us down the stretch here and big future. Stan on this side, row five in the back. Coach Mike Fitzpatrick from AP. Um, you and your family have been, you know, Connecticut residents now for a while. Um, I know you're completely focused on, on what you're doing, but uh, how much have you paid attention to what Yale has done, you know, oh, getting man. through the Ivy League and then um, their their win yesterday, and um, and just any fun stories, you know, people back home paying attention to both, and even yeah. I'm not asking to get ahead of yourself, but the prospect of you guys playing each other in the next round back yeah. in New England. Yeah, that that don't even that last part is something that hasn't registered. Me and James. Um, you know, I've been texting, um, you know, since a couple of weeks ago and, and uh, you know, his, his win in, uh, in the conference tournament there, incredible. Uh, his leadership, his coaching, you know, he's one of the best out there, uh, one of the most underrated coaches in the country and, uh, you know, just a total beast. And, um, and uh, it, it's just great. Uh, it's great for Connecticut. It, it, it's great for the state, you know. Um, you know, we, we, I know we say stores Connecticut, uh, you know, is, is the basketball capital world and, and we don't run from that, but, you know, maybe just the state of Connecticut kind of feels like the basketball capital of the world. Maybe we just, we add that, you know, stores into, into New Haven, you know, maybe we stretch that a little bit right now. We got a couple up here in the row two. Bradley Locker inside on you. Northwestern has not, or I should say, it was lost only one game all year by double digits and came back down too late against FAU. Kind of what does it say about the caliber of the team to avoid late holes? I mean, they play in the Big Ten, which is, is one of the best leagues, and it's a, a brutally physical league. Um, and I just think it speaks to, to, to Chris and the, the class and the pedigree and the, the culture and um, what he's built there is, is amazing. Um, it, it's one of the best you know, program building jobs that, that we've seen in, in the last 10, 15 years in our sport. Um, you know, they got obviously tremendous talent, uh, you know, but they got the right type of talent, the right type of players. Um, and, it, you know, it's, it's just, I say this about Marquette, I say this about certain people that we get a chance to play. Um, like, there's just no other, like, feeling. Sometimes when you play against programs that you know, um, you know, they're a house of cards. It's just based on just having really good players and talent. But you know their whole program is, is a house of cards. Um, you play against a Northwestern or a Marquette, like, you, this is like, um, you know, in some ways you feel like it's a privilege when you take the court against a program that's got culture and it's got tremendous players and great coaching because uh, it's, it's going to be an honorable matchup. We'll stay in that same row. A Dowling inside in you. Um, Coach Northwestern. All three of you guys? All three of us, yeah. Let's go, boys. Thank you. Um, slow paced team. Northwestern's a slow paced team. Doesn't turn the ball over a lot. The Big East is pretty unique because you guys play a bunch of teams at different speeds. Hmm. Um, I'm just wondering how you, what you've learned from the slow paced games in terms of how you run your motion offense and maintain that speed in the half court. Yeah. Um, I think we're, we're pretty versatile. Um, obviously, on stops and off turnovers, and Northwestern's hard to turn over. Um, you know, we, we feel like we could play any type of game. I, I don't, um, you know, I don't know necessarily we prefer, um, you know, just like a half court, um, exclusive half court battle, but uh, we're comfortable in that type of game as well. We, we, you know, we feel like we can, uh, you know, we're efficient enough offensively as, as, the, as the number one offense in the country that, that, that we could beat you in a possession game. We feel like bringing in a top 10 defense that, that, that we can guard people in the half court. And, and then we've excelled as a rebounding game, not at times yesterday and, and not for St. John's at MSG. That was disappointing, but uh, not that I'm still thinking about that. But, you know, we feel like we're well-rounded enough that we can win a lot of different types of games. We'll stay on row four on this side, and then we'll go to the other side for the next couple. 
uh, Coach uh, Stefan Castle, you talked about this before too, but just the five star comes in to ready made team. When you were recruiting him, did you know what you were getting in terms of mentality wise that he wasn't a diva, <laughs> that, he would, that he would be able to fit in? Um, or is, is that something you had to cultivate? No, I saw his, uh, Stacy and Quan, his parents, I saw him, them rip his, you know what, multiple times. Um, you know, they're not, his parents aren't fans. You know, they're, they're parents, uh, they hold him accountable, responsible uh, to have elite work ethic and, and being coachable and, uh, you know, not thinking that the world spins around him at 17, 18 years old. So, uh, you know, we knew what we were getting and, and NBA teams, uh, you know, they, they're, they're uh, they salivate over him because um, obviously we're a balanced team, so he doesn't get to show everything that's in his bag. Uh, that's why NBA teams, uh, from when the summer starts, they come and watch us practice, and they come and watch practices throughout the year where he gets a chance to showcase more of what he can do. So, uh, you know, game night, you know, because he's on a, a team that's, that's really high level, um, obviously he doesn't get a chance to show everything, but he's got the parents, man. And when, when you've got great parents, uh, um, it makes our job really, really easy. We'll go to the other side in row one, and then we'll go to the back. Gavin Key from the London Day. Dan, you guys only lost one to one non-conference opponent in the last two seasons. What, what makes you, why have you been so successful against in that situation? Um, I think our uniqueness, uh, you know, from an offensive standpoint, I think uh, the lack of familiarity with, uh, with just the, the different aspects of, of what we do from an offensive standpoint, the inside, the outside, the movement, the ball screen game. I think we could come at you in a, in a lot of different ways. Um, so we're a tough preparation uh, on, on short prep time. You know, and I think the, the biggest thing that, that makes you bulletproof in, in tournaments is, you know, do you, if you play elite defense, if you play elite offense, if you're a really, really strong rebounding team, if you play really, really hard, if you share the ball, um, if you're not reliant on one or two players to carry you, um, you know, it, it, if you've got Kamani Young and Luke Murray that prepare these teams for opponents uh, as good as most head coaches prepare their teams for opponents, you know, it just it puts you in a position, um, you know, where, where you're not too vulnerable. We'll stay on that same side in the back, Roger. Roger Rubin from Newsday. So, uh, hey, Dan. Um, so now that we know that you have a lucky hat, <laughs> can, you, uh, can you share with us some of the other things that the national champion coach is superstitious about? I mean, you know about the draws, right? Um, the, the draws, the underwear. You know, my wife's, um, you know, she was churning the hand, hand washer last night, uh, and then when I left this morning, they were hanging, and they, they looked droopy. Um, but she had the, the hair dryer on the hot, and she had a concoction set up to dry them. The socks got holes in them because I'm running the same socks. And then I got this, I'm, I've been running back with the same suit. See, because the problem, the reason why we lost to New Mexico State, throw out the COVID NCAA tournament, that whole thing, man, that, uh, that Maryland loss, uh, but the, the New Mexico State game, I got cute, and I tried to wear like a, a nice a nice blazer and, and some some really like nice shoes, and, and I didn't wear the same blue suits that I was wearing at Rhodey when we beat Creighton and played Oregon in that great game, and then beat Trey Young in Oklahoma, and then lost that Duke game. When I was having success in the tournament, I was just wearing that plain blue suit and that same dress shirt. I broke it back out last March, and. Um, that thing's at the dry cleaner. I'm gonna wear that uh, until somebody takes me out. <laughs> we'll come stay here on the front row. And on shoes this side. too, brutal shoes. The shoes are brutal. Wait till you, the brown shoes that would barely have a sole left. <laughs> Annie Constable from the Chicago Sun Times following up on this superstitious trend. When did all of this start? Have you always um, carried these superstitions with you through your career? Through the coaching, I think. As a player, you don't even. You know, you just get out there and you just go hoop. But sometimes you're just in the back of the locker room by yourself a lot. Everyone else is out there and it's just you and your thoughts. And, you know, you're not going to turn the TV on. So now, like, your mind is racing. So a lot of kind of the superstition things, the M&Ms and, you know, the clothes. It's almost like you're putting on armor 
It's, it's almost like watching Rafa Nadal before he serves. You know, he goes through this like weird process of things that settles him before he serves the ball. It just kind of takes my mind off of, um, uh, away from thinking about all the bad things that could happen over the course of the next couple hours. We'll do one final question down here. Row two on the aisle, inside and you. Coach typical inside on you. Um, Coach Collins talked about knowing you and your whole family since he was around 18. Was there a moment for you when you knew that Coach Collins was going to take the Wildcats and make it into a program that could reach back-to-back -back NCAA tournaments? I mean, he played like a coach, and anyone that maxes out the playing career the way Chris did, and then, you know, we obviously have the fathers in common. Um, I, I don't think that there's a coach that I probably can relate to more in our game than Chris. Um, Especially, you know, the way our two dads coached. I mean, our two dads poured every part of themselves and coached with such incredible emotion, passion, intensity. Um, you know, it, it, watching his dad at games uh, get so emotional and knowing how my dad feels at my games, I just think that there's probably not a coach besides my brother that I could relate to in our profession than Chris. And uh, I think we're so similar in, in so many ways. It uh, feels like you're kind of looking in the mirror. Just to follow up on that, you mentioned Max, you know, his playing career. Were you a fan of Chris Collins' finished basketball career? His what? Finish? His, yeah, his finished basketball career. I didn't know about that. I thought like Duke when he got <laughs> I was talking about when he got to the Final Four, my brother dragged me out there to see Duke. Um, I don't want the UConn fans hearing me talking good about Duke, but um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I was a fan. I was in Charlotte when he when he was uh, in the Final Four playing Arkansas on, on those teams. So, always been a fan of Chris. And then Chris recruited my players at St. Benedict's when I was a high school coach. So, I'm happy, really happy for his success. He's he's one of the one of the great guys in our business. All right, Coach. We appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. We'll see you in your blue suit tomorrow. Here are the uh, UConn players.
Hi there. Correct. up here in just a second. It'll be sophomore forward Mark Mitchell, sophomore guard Tyrese Proctor. We'll go right into questions for the student athletes. So just raise your hand. We have microphones on each end. We'll get a microphone to you. Please give your name and affiliation before asking your question. The Duke locker room is open during this time as well as dur during Coach Shire's time. So we can also get, you can also get stuff done there. 
But if we have questions for, uh, for Mark or Tyrese, just raise your hand. We'll get a microphone to you. We'll start on the other side of the room in row one. Uh, Jackson Hepner from The Breeze, Jamie's student newspaper. Um, just to kind of start off, I was wondering kind of your thoughts on JMU this season. You know, they kind of made a bit of a splash early, just kind of, just some early impressions. We'll start with Tyrese, and then we'll go to Mark. Yeah, um, obviously just watched some film today, um, quick turnaround. You know, they're a physical team. Um, they try to speed the game up and muck the game up defensively, um, and they just play free offensively. Uh, they like to get downhill. So I think the more that we can just be disciplined and, and – um, just stay focused on you know us and um, you know our defense has been good all year, but I think it's going to be mainly offensively for us, just not getting sped up and limiting uh, all of our turnovers. Um, yeah, obviously um, they've been a good team all season. Obviously beating Michigan State at Michigan State to start the year, and um, I mean they were ranked for uh, a while there at the beginning, so just that, definitely been on our radar for a while. Um, a really good team. Um, only have three losses. So that speaks to how good they are. So we can't under, under, underestimate anyone just because their conference or anything like that. We know they're a good team, and uh, we're going to prepare hard for them. We'll stay. Up. We'll go on this side. We'll start with row two. Hi, Mackenzie Sheehy with the Duke Chronicle. Um, this is for both of you, but you lost in the round of 32 last year. Mark, you didn't get to play. What will be your mindset going into this, having learned from last year um, from that loss? Let's do the same order, Tyrese first, then Mark. Yeah, um, it's kind of ironic. Coach talked about it this morning. Um, it's sort of the same, same matchup against Tennessee last year. Um, two teams that are both physical, try and muck the game up, out-bully you. Um, so I think you know, playing in that game last year is really going to help us this year. Um, you know, we've, we've sort of played in games like this all year. Um, so we've shown that we can handle it. I think the main thing is just limiting our turnovers. You know, if we come out, start the game, um, and throw the first punch, it's going to send a message to them. And I think that's just what we need to do, just be the aggressors all night. Um, and I think, you know, we'll take care of business. Yeah, obviously I didn't play in that game last year, but I'm just piggybacking off what Tyrese said. Obviously for me, watching from a different perspective, um, just it's going to take a lot of fight, obviously, they're really – physical team, they're going to bring a lot of physicality to the game and just um, us being tough, being together and just fighting them for 40 minutes is probably what's going to matter most. We'll go back to the other side, back to row one. Tyrese, uh, you know, last night I was able to kind of sit um, along the court um, for the Vermont game and I kind of just noticed you're really vocal out there. I mean, you're always, you're, you're yelling a lot. I mean, they're even just like even just like you know telling people where to go and like on the defensive side, but also just like shouting discipline to kind of get guys in the right headspace. Talk to me a little bit of just like being a vocal leader and how that's kind of helped you during your time at Duke. Yeah, um, I just try to do anything to help our team win. To be honest with you, um, you know, being a captain, being a point guard, I see the floor. I got to be on on timing with Coach Shire and and you know sort of pick his brain on court as well and sort of spread his message. Um, so just trying to relay messages that he tells me, um, trying to stay vocal, like you said, and, and just make sure everyone on the court is locked in. Um, you know, don't want anyone feeling like they're alone out there, especially defensively. Um, so coaches always emphasize, you know, just, just, just letting, letting your brother know that you have his back, stuff like that. And um, I think that's just been a big focus for me this year. Last year, you know, I was vocal as well, but I feel like I really stepped it up this year and I'm going to have to continue to do that in order for us to win. We're going to come back to this side, row four on the aisle. Go ahead, Ralph. Hi, guys. Ralph Russo from the Associated Press. I guess we'll start with Mark. Uh, yesterday with Wisconsin, they were bothered by JMU's pressure, and they also missed a lot of point-blank shots. Do you think getting rushed, being, as you say, having a game mucked up, can lead to when you do get the good shot, then missing it? Are those things do those things end up getting linked or uh, um, in some ways? Um, yeah, obviously um, when you play a pretty physical team, I think especially when you're just around the basket, um, just having easy looks are going to make everything hard for you. So I think just um, concentrating when you get the ball going up strong for all of us. Um, I mean, yesterday I think how we attacked the basket, having 29 free throws, um, just trying to replicate that and just um, obviously us inside and just the guards attacking the basket at the same time, just us going up strong and just playing through physicality um, against a team like that. 
Do we have any more questions for the student athletes? We'll stay on this side in row three in the middle. Jamal Murphy, Bill Roden on sports. To both, to both guys, uh, what's the mentality, you know, come playing as a high seed against a lower seed? Even in the second round, you're doing the same thing. Obviously, you say you don't, you're not going to take them lightly. But even having to say that to yourself was kind of like a, a reminder. Um, is that something you talk about beforehand? Because obviously, when you play in those games, if, if, you know, the, the crowd can turn on you. Um, do you almost treat it like a road game sometimes? Like, is there any discussion of that? Let's go Mark, and then we'll go Tyrese. Um, honestly, I mean, I, don't, I haven't really thought about the seating much. Um, I just know they're a really good basketball team. Um, obviously, when you're in the course of a game, you can definitely feel the crowd shift at times. But I think us being here at Duke, we're used to that. Uh, I mean, we're rarely ever rooted for, unless we're at home, we're at the Garden, honestly. So um, it's not done anything new to us. We've been here before, and I think our experience is going to help us in those moments. Yeah, like Mark said, I feel like it's everyone versus Duke, um, especially on the road or at neutral sites. Um, you know, you've got other games coming in, so UConn fans will probably be there. Um, Northwestern fans will probably be there. So, you know, it sort of felt like a little bit of a away game in that second half yesterday as well. And, um, you know, doubt can't creep in. Um, as soon as doubt creeps in, you know, it could go sideways. So I feel like, you know, we're all connected. We're all together. Um, and that's just the main focus. We'll stay on that same side in row five in the back. Kate Rogerson from WTBD in Raleigh. Um, for the both of you, you won yesterday by 17 points. Flip only scored three points. I know the stat sheet showed otherwise how he contributed, but as you reviewed the film and watched the tape, what does that say about this team that your top scorer didn't have his best night offensively, but you still won by such a big margin? Let's go Tyrese first, then Mark. Uh, I just feel like it shows how versatile we are. Uh, I sort of said it all year. Um, we have seven, eight guys that, that can do a lot of different things, and. Um, you know, they decided to double flip early in the post, and uh, we had a counter to that. Um, I don't think it's smart to double flip in the post because he's one of the best passers in the country. Um, but, I mean, I think it just shows how versatile we are. Uh, everyone can do everything, and um, I think, you know, when we're all connected on a string, um, it helps our team. Um, yeah, obviously we have a lot of firepower, and obviously, um, you know, I, I don't think I'd put it as flip and have it go. I think he was just, just playing with the game. Um, they were doubling him in the post, and he gave us a lot of good open shots um, all around. And I think we just contributed off the double they were giving him, and just his passing is obviously uh, good for us. So, um, yeah. I do see someone with a raised hand in the Zoom call, Dan Tortora. So I'm going to put Dan, I'm going to allow you to talk, and then you can ask your question, OK? So go ahead. Dan Tortora, wake up call DT.com. For the student athletes, just what you can say about the fact that the ACC has not just this season, but it seems like in general have had some disrespect from the committee and the amount of teams that have gotten in and just overall hasn't always been given the respect these last few years. Duke has been able to bounce back from that and to show what you can do nationally. Just what you can say about representing not only Duke, but the ACC. We'll go Tyrese first, then Mark. Uh, I think it just shows how strong the conference is. Um, you know, I feel like there's many teams in ACC that could have made the tournament and would have, would have hanged with a lot of teams at the tournament. Um, I mean, I think it's just a credit to how strong and physical and, and how good the ACC play is. Yeah, I think uh, exactly what Tyree said. I think we have a lot of good teams in our conference. Um, a lot of teams that get overlooked, but I think um, this time of year shows every year that uh, the ACC can uh, stack up with the best of them. Any more questions for the student athletes? Okay. You guys are excused. We'll see you tomorrow. A reminder, the Duke locker room is open at this time. Right now, Coach Shire is scheduled to arrive at 3.30. This is now 3.21.
could start. So Okay, we have Duke head coach John Shire up on the podium at this time. Start with an opening statement from coach and then we will open it up to questions. Once again, we have microphones at each end, so just raise your hand. We'll get a microphone to you, give name and affiliation before you ask your question. But coach, if you want to start with an opening statement. Yeah, well obviously it's uh, good to be back and seeing you guys. It means we're playing another game and uh, you know, proud of the effort last night. Uh, Good to get that win, and you have to move on so quickly. And we know what a great challenge this will be against James Madison. They're a really good team. Uh, they have great depth, great toughness, uh, and uh, really just getting our guys familiar. We've been in this situation three other times this season where you play a game with one day of prep, excuse me, of prep in between. And so for us, it's been the same, same focus, turning the page. And uh, really excited for this opportunity. Anytime you get to play in a game to go to a Sweet 16, um, our guys are connected, fired up, and uh, really ready to turn the page here. We'll start on this side on the aisle in row four. This side. John David Teal with the Times Dispatch in Richmond. Last year at this juncture of the tournament, you encountered a very physical opponent right. in Tennessee. Last night, Greg Gard said JMU was as physical a team as they had seen all year. Is that also your observation from film study and such? Yeah, I mean, it, it jumps off the page at you, no question. And I think the experiences this team has been through and the uh, – different teams you've played prepares us for that. You know, it's, you, you, can't, you can't be on your heels, that's for sure. You know, if they put you on your heels, it's going to be a long night. And, uh, you know, I think for our guys, they remember that Tennessee game like yours yesterday. Uh, I can mention some other teams we played this year that are really physical and really good, and I'll put James Madison up there with any of them. And that's uh, a ton of respect for them, but also for our guys, uh, I feel there's no question we're ready for that as well. We'll come on the other side of the room here in row one. Um, Kaden Bridges with JMU Student Newspaper, The Breeze. Um, obviously, the Dukes have made some commotion this year. Have they been a team that's been on your radar? And if so, like, what's really stuck out to you the most about them and what they've done this season? Well, you know, they've. Uh, it, it's not when you're. It's when you're coaching. It's you have tunnel vision. At least I do. So you're not following everybody so closely. Although. Uh, we played Michigan State right away, you know, our third game of the year. And so you watch that game that James Madison played at Michigan State. So I remember watching 
and just being really impressed with what they did, you know, and, you know, it jumps off the page. They have, they have high major players, you know, their whole team. I mean, everybody that comes in the game, uh, their size, their, their skill level. Uh, obviously, they're one of the most experienced teams in the country. And anytime you go through a season and you have three losses, you know, that's really impressive. Like, that's the making of a special season. And so for these guys, we've known about them. You know, I've known about them. You know, obviously, the last 24 hours, I've studied them a lot closer and have a much better feel. But the respect level, 100% is there at the highest level. We'll come back to this side of the room. We're in row three on the aisle. Then we're going to go to row five. Shane Metlin from the Daily News Record, Harrisonburg, Virginia. Um, oh, there he goes. <laughs> you, you, you coached against uh, T.J. Bickerstaff when he was at BC, and um, you know Mike Scroggie on your staff. He, he's coached in one games against Mark Byington's JMU teams. Do those things help when you have such a quick turnaround and trying to uh, to get ready for a team in a tournament setting? Well, sure, anything helps. You know, it's uh, it's it is a quick turnaround, and the the amazing thing with I feel the staff we've put together uh, is the the diversity of the different experiences guys have had. And you know, for Stragi being a head coach, uh, especially in this uh, CAA, um, uh, Emmanuel coming from the SEC or the Big Twelve, I should say, Jay from the SEC. You know, sometimes you'll run into opponents they've already scouted or they've known. So that helps. But they're a different team. You know, I, I think you know, like Bickerstaff, he's a different player than he was at BC. And he was a really good player there, too. But he's a different player. I think their team is different than how they've been. Uh, but certainly any of that helps to get familiar in, in a quick turnaround because it's hard. You're, I'm so focused on Vermont, and that's it. And you uh, – you have to have your staff ready for Wisconsin, for James Madison. You don't know what's going to happen, and our staff is fully prepared. We're going to stay on this side in row five, and then we'll go back across. Go ahead, row five. Hey, John. Steve Wiseman from the News and Observer. Uh, you guys held Vermont 25 points below their season scoring average last night. Uh, what's your assessment of what, the way you guys played defense last night, and is it replicable going forward? Well, I, th I thought the, the defense was terrific for us, Steve. I mean, I, I thought the, the collective effort and focus was there. Are there some breakdowns and things you have to clean up? Sure, like of course. Uh, but Vermont's a tough team to guard, the way they spread you, the, their movement. Uh, James Madison is no different. They do the same. They really spread you and put you in situations where you really have to talk off the ball and obviously on the ball. Um, but I'm proud of the effort. Like you, you advance in this tournament not by your offense. You advance by your defense. And that's something over that seven-day stretch in between us playing, we put a lot of emphasis on, and our guys uh, took that to heart. We'll go to the other side. We're in row four. John, Steve Serby, New York Post. How did Coach K, when you, were a play, uh, when you were a player and as a coach for him, handle and prevent complacency? Oh, man. That's <laughs> many different ways. Yeah. Uh, I could go, I could run, I could have a whole list of all the different things that he would do. And I think the, the brilliance of Coach K, what he's always done is he, he would never handle a situation. He wouldn't handle all situations the same, right? So, you know, if he didn't feel like you were as into it as you should be, he may handle it differently for you versus somebody else. And that's the brilliance of him, uh, the motivation behind every game, every team, every player. Uh, no one thing was the same. I think that's what made him so special. So we've tried to replicate and, and do ourselves. Uh, but Coach was the best of that, just uh, being able to push the right buttons at different times. So I can't give you an answer specifically because it's, he would do all, all different things all the time. Staying on that same side, one row back. Nicole Auerbach, The Athletic. John, uh, Duke's no stranger to being, you know, the, the higher seed in a game against a mid-major that's, uh, you know, compelling and competitive, or the arena kind of roots against Duke, um, especially if UConn's going to be in the same session. H how do you guys handle those types of environments um, or experiences, especially when you do have a team that just pulled off an upset, so you are, you know, facing a team like that that maybe no one's going to call them a Cinderella, but people are going to pull for? Well, you know, Nicole, I think it's one of the um – unique experiences of the tournament that you, you, you really can't feel unless you're there in person. And even our Vermont game, what happens is 
especially the, the first two days of the tournament. You know, obviously the arenas, they, they, everybody leaves before the second session, right? And so the, the beginning of the game can feel a little bit quieter than, than we're normally used to. And all of a sudden, the, the team starts filling in for the second game. And uh, you could feel last night in the, in, the, uh, in the Vermont game, where all of a sudden, pretty sure we had three schools rooting against us, if not more. And for us, it's a blessing. Look, it is, and then at the end of the day, we go on the road, and it's a whiteout, it's a blackout, it's uh, sellouts. And that's the responsibility you have wearing Duke across your chest, but it's also you'd rather play in those environments. And so you know it's probably going to be more like a road game tomorrow. I, I know our Duke fans are going to show up and be loud too, uh, but that's part of the beauty of playing in the NCAA tournament. You, you get to play in a sold-out crowd where people, there's a lot of people that, there, that are there that really want you to win. There's obviously going to be people that don't want you to win, and that's how it goes, and I think we're used to that. Come to this side. We're on row five on the aisle, and then we have another one, I think, in row five. Row five on the aisle first, on the aisle, and then we'll go to her next. Connor O'Neill with Devils Illustrated. John, to kind of follow up on that, is there any way to evaluate how a player reacts to these situations of being a polarizing school like Duke in the recruiting process, or is it just see how they react when they show up and go through the stuff? I, uh, we don't wing it if that's what you're asking. You know, I don't just say, well, let's see if this kid has <laughs> A chance, but uh, we we scout for it. Uh, we talk to their coaches, families, and I think you can tell Connor. To be honest with you, you know, you you watch at some of the biggest tournaments, and naturally the guys who have done best the best here, they they raise their level of competition and just their their readiness in in certain environments, and that's what we we try to see them in those environments. Uh, the Peach Jams and you know the, you know, the the big tournaments, the big tournaments, and uh, that's always translated well for us, and uh, it's important. It's as important as anything. We'll stay in that last row. Continue. Go ahead. Kate Rogers, WTVD. Kind of following up on both of those questions, Coach, your team always plays with some sort of confidence and swagger, but this week it seems like they're really on a mission to prove everyone wrong. They feel like everyone's rooting against them more than usual. Why is that with this group? Why, do they, why are they on a mission to prove everyone wrong? Well, um, you know, I, I think, look, I, I hope these guys play for themselves, first and foremost, and they play for the people that have stuck, stuck with them and their families and all that. But you also, as a competitor, no matter what, you hear t different things. And some of it, rightfully so, people have, when you're at Duke, whether you're the coach, whether you're a player, uh, you put yourself in a position where you're critiqued. That, that comes with the territory. Uh, but also, you can use that to motivate you too. And our guys, the thing I've loved about coaching these guys for the first two years is they've never made excuses after any loss, after any setback. And they have always doubled down on what we've believed, what we've believed with where we need to go. And I think it's no different after that NC State loss, the week of practice, the week of prep. And I was really proud of just their, their mindset coming into the Vermont game. And, you know, we're going to need to do that and more, you know, tomorrow against James Madison. Uh, but I'm not surprised knowing the character of our team. And uh, it's the reason I feel they're at Duke, end of the day. We're staying on this side in row three. Go ahead. Jamal Murphy, Bill Roden, sports. Maybe this is the last follow-up to those last three questions. But as a coach, you, you know, coming into the, your highest seed, lower seed, you know the, the crowd's going to be against you. Is that something you address with, with the team? Are you, do you say, hey, this is going to be like a road game, so be prepared? Is, something that you need, is that something that you need to do? And then as a player, you, you, you were in the same situations at Duke. You know, what was, you know, what were your, what was your thought process then? Yeah, it's, uh, I, think, I think no matter what, the, the first time you go through it, it can knock you back a little bit. And... Uh, I experienced it in a hard way my freshman year against VCU. You know, we're, we're up in the second half and then the momentum and it's a, uh, when it's one and done, it's part of what makes the tournament so special. It's part of what makes it so cruel is it's, it's one and done. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but as a coach, you know, I mentioned it briefly to him. Like I said something to him this morning, but our guys, 
by now we've seen it. You know, I think we felt it last night, and in a lot of respects, I think they like it. <laughs> it's it's part of it, it's it's what comes when you sign up to come to Duke. It just is, and uh, they've handled it really well. You know, we we lost our first two road games of the season. Since then, we've you know played great away from home, neutral sites, and you know neutral a lot of times becomes where it can be a little bit of a road game, which is I think fueled our group more than anything. Next two will come in row two. We'll start on the end of the row, and then we'll come into the aisle. Thank you. Um, Alex Abramovich from the Fayetteville Observer. John, last night, um, Flip only took that one shot, as we talked about, but also your bench only had four points. Those two things, can they happen again for you to advance? Probably not. You know, probably not. I mean, Flip, we have to get him more than one shot. You know, that's on me. That's on us, you know, for the guards. When he's open, we have to hit him. But also, they sold out to double him. And so credit to him for making the right play, and we got some wide open threes. And so that's one of the most, I think, the, one of the best parts of his game is his passing. Now, one shot, it's probably not good for us at the end of the day. You know, he needs to take more than one shot. I need to help him do that. But, and as far as the bench goes, they can make an impact without scoring. You know, I thought Jalen Blakes and Sean, you know, both those guys, Jalen and Sean brought a, uh, an energy, a toughness, uh, Ryan and TJ have to be ready. Like, we need everybody in this. And so scoring would be a bonus, but really what they bring to the table is more than just scoring. And the fact that we have, you know, those five starters, they all can score. They all can go off for 20 points on a given night. They all can score in double figures. Uh, but flip is probably we need to get more than one shot. It's probably going to be a good thing for us. We're going to stay on that same row or at the other end of the row on the aisle. Coach Mackenzie Sheehy with the Duke Chronicle. Is there a particular opponent this year, specifically within the ACC, that you feel like has prepared you to play JMU? <coughs> Probably not one specific team. You know, they're, they're unique uh, with how they play and who they are. But I think they're a combination of some teams. You know, we've, NC State pressures you really well. You know, Carolina's defense is <coughs> physical and really good. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Virginia's Clemson, they play, you know, physical and really tough defense. So I would say a combination of those teams. We'll go back to <laughs> row four and then we'll come back across. Go ahead, David. John, how familiar are you with Jalen Carey given the family connections? <laughs> well, Jalen, you know, he came on the visit with Vernon and, uh, you know, he didn't say a whole lot at the time and, you know, was younger. But obviously the Carey family, they, they just, they're a great family and, great people and really happy for Jalen how he's developed he's just gotten better and better you know I've watched him play in EYBL and growing up and you could tell he always worked at it you know his skill level just always got better he's done a great job there it's been a great fit for him it seems like uh, but um, yeah I've, I remember seeing Jalen go and watch Vernon play in high school the official visit uh, he'd always be shooting in the gym you know it just seemed like he always loved it and, uh, you know, happy for him with all the success that he's had. We're going to the other side of the room. We're in row one. Go ahead. All right, Jackson Hebner from the Breeze. You know, talking to a lot of people from JMU about this matchup, it kind of feels like for those of us who are unfamiliar with Duke, the myth has exceeded reality. Um, so just, you know, from your perspective, as someone who kind of knows the program probably more than anybody, what is something about Duke that those of us who are outside of Duke don't, like, know or understand? Yeah, that's going to end with the toughest question. That's, um, I, think, uh, I think the biggest thing about playing at Duke is it can feel like it's, uh, you know, look, we have, it's amazing playing here. Like, it's, it's a privilege. You get to, you know, play in front of a lot of people and you're uh, playing on a big stage and people care, you know, no matter what, wherever you are. Uh, but it's also, to me, the hardest place to play because you get everybody's best shot. You're really scrutinized when it doesn't go as well. Um, you compete like crazy in practice against other guys that are really, really good players. And that's what's always made this place special to me is the, is the competition. You know, and it's the ability to handle adversity with the mindset of making no excuses. 
And so I don't know if everybody looks at Duke and sees that. I think they can look on the surface and think or assume different things. But this program's been built on work. It's been built on competition. And it's been built on moments like this where you get a chance to play special teams in the tournament, see where you're at, and lay it all out there. And uh, that's, for me, what it's all about, being the head coach here and a former player. And I think other former players would tell you the same. Any more questions for Coach? We'll come down here. Last one will be down here at the end of row one on this side. Matt Giles, Blue Devil Country. Coach, between your time as a player and assistant and head coach, you've seen every outcome except we're losing in the national championship game. What Is that right? I, I didn't even realize that. That's yeah. Started out the worst. With, it uh, did. Yeah. That's, that's hopefully we keep <laughs> trending, yeah. So is there a common trait that you've observed from the teams that maybe advance several weeks into the tournament versus the ones that don't? I think the, the, the most important thing when you're playing in the tournament, you're playing teams at some point in each game, they're going to make a run. And you have to be connected enough and tough enough to handle the run. And, you know, if you look at the Vermont game, they cut it to two a couple times. But, like, those are the moments where you need to respond. And uh, you're, playing, you're playing teams, especially as you advance in the tournament, the desperation is, is incredible. And, uh, you know, tomorrow it's going to be that same feeling. And so you have to respond to runs, and you have to have the mental toughness to handle those moments. And I can go through each season, whether it's if you want to bring up the worst ones early or if you want to bring up the, the best ones at different moments, where 2010 you're playing Baylor in the Elite Eight and you're down four with a few minutes to go. You have to respond. National Championship in 2015, you're down nine to Wisconsin, second half, you have to respond. And uh, I can go down the list, but to me, uh, that's the difference. It's, it's the mental toughness to, to handle those moments. Coach, we appreciate you taking the time. Thank we you all. We'll see you tomorrow. Thanks. Sounds good. We'll have James Madison student athletes at 3.55, so seven minutes from now. James Madison student athletes followed by Coach Jones at 4.15.
James Madison. Yeah, they're supposed to be here right now. Okay, we have the James Madison student athletes coming up on the podium right now. Oh, apparently we have a third player. Hold on. All right, we will uh, we'll go straight into questions for the student athletes. So if you have a question, just raise your hand. We will get a microphone to you. We will start on the back row on the aisle. Good morning, guys. Um, for, well, really any of you, though, maybe Jalen's the best guy for this. Um, you did a nice job on Wisconsin seven footer last night. Um, Flapowski is, I don't know, maybe you guys tell me, is he a similar player? Do you think similar tactics, similar type defense uh, works on him like it did on Wisconsin's big man? Uh, yeah, um, just same game plan, deny and stuff like that, but he's a lot more skilled than the Wisconsin big, but it's for sure going to be a challenge tomorrow night, but excited for it. We'll stay on the same aisle, row three. Zach Brazeller, New York Post, for I guess for all three of you guys, what is it like to, to be where you are? I mean, program record and wins, playing Duke for a chance to go to the Sweet 16 for a program that hadn't won a real, you know, a main tournament game since 1983. Can you just describe kind of what 
this whole year and this moment's like? Start with Noah, then we'll go Terrence, then Jalen. I think I'm gonna let Terrence take this one. Um, I think we, um, you know, this is what we do it for, to put on for the university and stuff like that, and for the, um, for the future for recruits and stuff like that, to get people to come to James Madison. Um, it's a big university, great campus, um, great um, fans. So yeah, that's what we're doing it for, just to show people that you can actually go to a mid-major and you can beat these type of um, opponents. Jalen? Uh, yeah, um, it's basically you just put the work in, you can really go out there and compete with anybody, like what Fa said. Um, it's just coming together and just working and working and taking out big, big schools one at a time. We're going to stay on that same side in row one, then we'll come across. Go ahead, row one. All right, Jackson Hepper from the Braves. Great to see you all this morning. Good to see you. Um, I have this question for uh, Jalen. Um, you know, obviously your brother went to Duke. Um, you know, yeah, coach was talking, you know, talking earlier about kind of his memories of you going on recruiting trips and stuff. What is it like for you and your family to be playing against the Blue Devils? Uh, it's a crazy experience. Um, it's crazy how things come full circle. It's a, as a kid, you've always dreamed of playing for Duke or playing against them, and it's crazy that we're doing it in March Madness and at the Barclays Center. We'll come to the other side of the room here in row two. Go ahead. Uh, Shane Batlin, Daily News Record, Harrisonburg. Um, all three of you guys can chime in, but um, for Terrence in particular, you, you were just talking about future recruiting for this program, and you, you've kind of been on that like train for a while now, talking about the future. And, you know, you guys stayed at JMU for four years. I guess, why did that kind of become your thing that like not only did you stick around, but you're looking to the future of the program long long after you're going to be there? Um, I can kind of say that I, I actually care about James Madison University um, and the people up there. Um, they stuck with me from the, the time I committed to this university. So um, I felt like I owe that back to the university is to get wins and make history. So yeah, um, Coach Bonton is a great coach. Um, I don't see why nobody want to come play for him. And, and yeah, like this style of play that we play is, is built for, for dogs. And if you're a dog, I think you should come to JMU. Coming on the other side of the aisle here in row three. Zach Brazil in New York Post. What, what did that Michigan State win do for you guys? Did, I mean, how much did that just change everything to, to start the year with a win like that? Why don't we start with Noah, then we'll go Terrence, then Jalen. Uh, yeah, I think it just sparked our confidence and really got us rolling. Uh, once we got those first two road wins, uh, we knew we had a chance to do something special. And I think that really kept us locked in and like taking one game at a time. Yeah, same. I think it helped us, like, like uh, Noah said, like with our confidence and stuff. But we always believed in each other and our coaching staff. Like, they always told us that we can do those type of things. And we came together as a group and the players. And we went into Michigan State knowing that we wanted to win the game. And that was our main focus. So yeah, um, ever since we won the, that first week of the season, um, it changed our season around. And, and we knew we had a, a chance to do what we did last night to make it to the NCAA tournament and actually win. Uh, yeah, uh, I feel like even before Michigan State, like we knew like we had a, a great group of guys. And we were a special group. So. Just going into Michigan State in that first week, it like gave us the extra confidence that we needed to go out there and do what we do and bring us all the way to March Madness to this point right here. We're going to come to this side of the room. Row three, go ahead. Yep. Jamal Murphy, Bill Roden on Sports. Taking, taking out brand names, uh, coach speak, X's and O's. How do you feel you match up with Duke just individual for individual? Let's uh, do the same order. Noah, then Terrence, then Jalen. Uh, yeah, we only got a one look at Scout so far. Um, we'll do a lot more of that tonight, but uh, I think we match up fine. Uh, I think we're just as physical as them. Um, and I think that we can play to, play to our strength there and uh, just be kind of what we were on defense last night. Yeah, like I said in the other press conference, I feel like we can match up with any other team in the country, um, no matter how big and how strong guys is. Like we actually, we actually are strong. We don't look that very big out there, but we actually are strong. We actually put in the work in the weight room. so. When it's time for a, a big, strong opponent, we don't back down. We like bring it, bring it to them and see how they respond. So yeah. Yeah, I think we match up good. Um, we we matched up every, good with every other team so far. So it's just another game and another matchup. We just ready to go out there and do what we do. We're gonna come back to this side, on the aisle, row five. Go ahead, Ralph. So uh, Terrence, I'm gonna let you do some recruiting. Um, 
because I think people look at the matchup and go, Duke is the big school and JMU is the little school. Maybe they don't know all the good stuff you guys have. When, if you had, if somebody asked you, hey man, what's it like to play in your program? Would you got like a little gym or something? Like, what would you tell them? Um, I'll tell them it's beautiful. Um, everybody who's been to JMU know our facilities are, are very elite. Um, as soon as you walk in the building, um, you, you just want to commit. So, um, like, yeah, we have everything that every high major school has as far as everything. Like, football team is, is great. Like, everybody's great around. Like, we have the best, some of the best fans in the country. Um, and, we, and we have the best, we, and I feel like we have the best coaches in the conference. So, I mean, the country. So, you put all that together, and it just makes you want to stay, do college for your whole life. We'll come back to this side of the room on row two. Kind of follow up on that a little bit. Um, I think Jalen and Noah, you both came to football games and committed pretty much really quickly after doing that. Like, can you, can you kind of expand on that even beyond like just seeing the basketball facilities and things that you know really sparked your interest in JMU? Let's go Noah first, then Jalen. Yeah, I came on during the spring game. And uh, just being outside and the weather and all the people that were out there, it was just a super good vibe and seemed like everyone was a, like one big unit. And uh, the fans, even at the spring game, like for a spring game, were good. And uh, the, like uh, Terrence said, the facilities are unbelievable. Our gym, our training room, our weight room, all that. It was pretty much a no-brainer for me. Uh, yeah, I had came in uh, fall for like their first uh, big home game in. I just fell in love with the place, with the with, with the guys and um, the coaching staff. Everybody just felt like family and home. So I knew it was perfect. And the facility, it was beautiful. It was probably the best facility I toured from a college. So I knew on spot. I knew I wanted to go there. We're going to come back here in the front, row one, on the other side of the room. You know, a lot of the a few of the guys from Duke were kind of talking about, like, you know, how hungry and motivated they were to make the Sweet 16, but you know, that's a program that's, they're not just used to the Sweet 16, that's like the expectation. How does it feel for you guys playing for JMU who's never been to the Sweet 16 ever? Why don't we start with Terrence, and then we'll go Noah, then Jalen. Um, I can kind of say, you know, stuff like this, one, um, you know, in a lifetime probably don't happen twice. So um, we just taking, we living in a moment right now, and we, um, and, and and like you said, like Duke used to get into the Sweet 16 and stuff like that, and JMU is not. So I feel like we have the better edge um, if you're looking at it like that. Um, so yeah, we just can't wait to get out there. Noah? Uh, I would say we had pretty high expectations just as a team, just being around the teammates in the locker room talking this year. And uh, yeah, like we're not here by luck or anything like that. Like this was our goal, and we worked hard for it. So we're just, yeah, ready to go. Yeah, this is something like as a kid that you always dreamed of playing in March Madness, and, and now we're playing Duke, which is crazy. So it's just like, this is a moment we are ready for, and we're ready to live it. We'll stay on that same side on the aisle in row three. For uh, any of you guys, do you, do you feel like the underdog? You know, you, you obviously didn't play like it the other night against Wisconsin. Um, you know, there were people, you know, who weren't sure of what you guys can do because um, of the conference you come from. Did, do you feel like like an under, underdog team? Let's do Noah first, then Terrence, then Jalen. I'm going to let Terrence take this one again. <laughs> um, I feel like we've always been the underdog going forward this season. Um, I feel like everybody forgot about us after week one. Um, so we came together as a team. We always felt like the underdog. Um, even when we play a team where they got us winning and stuff like that, we just always feel like the underdog. That's why we come out there and play with that edge like that. We do have a hand raised on the Zoom call. Uh, Dan Tortora, so I'm going to hit allow to talk. Dan, I'm hitting allow to talk right now, so go ahead. Dan Tortora, wake up call, DT.com. For each of the student athletes, just what it means to you to represent JMU and to have a national spotlight. You've spoken on a lot of things that attracted you to the school and made you want to go there, but just what it means to be able to wear that across your chest and to know you have an opportunity to make history. We'll do Terrence, then Noah, then Jalen. Um, it feels good, you know, um, when you plan for a university, this is what you dream of, um, actually putting a university like this um, on the map, um, especially for men's basketball at JMU because they've never been this far. And like I said, like since 1983, so, you know, it's 2024. It's been a decade since they did something like this. So, yeah, it's been, it's been great. It's been a great run with these group of guys. Um, to get where we at today, and like Noah said, it's not all, um, ain't none of this luck, this all work. 
Yeah, I would say I'm just excited that and just thankful for the way JMU welcomed me just as a person and a player and uh, to be able to represent and just pay the favor back is special and we're not taking it for granted. Yeah, it's just, the, it's just a blessing and an opportunity to come out here and do it for a, a community that, that loves us the same way that we love them. And we're just, just ready to go out there and continue to do what we do for the Dukes. Any more questions for the student athletes? Okay. You guys are excused. We will see you tomorrow. Yes, sir. James Madison locker room is still open. Coach Byington is scheduled to be on the podium in five minutes. All right, we have Coach Byington up on the podium right now. We'll start with an opening statement from Coach, and then we'll uh, go to questions. And again, just raise your hand. We'll get microphone to you, give name and affiliation before asking your question. But Coach, if you want to start with an opening statement. Yeah, I mean, we're happy uh, to have the opportunity um, to keep advancing and keep playing in the NCAA tournament. And, you know, last night, you know, was, was a great night for us. and. Um, you know, we wanted guys to be able to cherish it, but with the fast turnaround, we, we, we forced everybody to turn around quickly, and my staff and players, and we had to get back to the hotel, even though it was late last night, and, and, and give our full attention to a really good Duke team. So it's, um, it's a quick prep, and um, by this point in the season, you've seen a lot of things, and, and um, Duke's got some things that we haven't seen this year. So it's a... Uh, it's a, it's, it's a challenge, and, and, and we love it. We embrace it, and um, you know we're excited about it to be able to play tomorrow. We'll start on the other side of the room on the aisle in row three. Zach Brazil in your post. I think I read that um, you, you you didn't want to actually play at Michigan State, but you you, you kind of felt like you had to for your team. And why didn't you want to play that game? And in hindsight, how much of that? set you guys up for this kind of year? Yeah, I mean, uh, at our university, we got to play guarantee games. And um, so we got to play a certain amount of games to, to make money for, for our basketball program and our budget. And, and um, my choice in that was to find somebody regional, um, find, find a team regionally to be able to buy us to come play. And we couldn't find that. And um, so we had to get on a plane and go fly. and. And the reason I didn't want to do that is because we fly so much, travel's hard, it's not easy to get in there. And you're looking at it, you know, it's easy to look at now and say, all right, you're going to win. But you're looking at going in, you know, they don't lose in November. Um, you know, Izzo is one of the best coaches in the country and the challenges and that first night. And we also knew we had Kent State right after, hadn't lost in their home arena in two years. So we're looking at probably one of the toughest first weeks of any team in the country. So I'd, I'd rather find a, a worse Power 5 team, but we end up playing them, and yeah, it worked out for us. We'll go to the other side of the room on the end, row four. Good morning, Coach Ralph Russo from AP. When you were hired, if I remember correctly, the, the new facility had maybe just opened and you couldn't even see it because it was during COVID. Mm -hmm. um, how much did your decision to come to JMU how much was, was linked to their sort of athletic program vision, uh, what they had built, you know, prior to you getting there? Yeah, the, the vision of, of Jeff Bourne and President Alger um, was extremely important on why I wanted the job and took the job. Um, I didn't want to come to a place that wasn't committed, and um, I had a good situation where I was before, and I didn't need to leave. And once I came there, I thought it could be a place where we can get to a higher level. And the arena was almost being completed and I saw the success that all the athletic programs have and I thought it hasn't been done in basketball but the blueprints there for teams at JMU and we got to figure out how to carve our path but the teams have done it and and it is just a culture with the administration um, with the school that that I thought we could be a part of and be successful in we're going to stay on this side we're going to go row two uh, Shane Metlin daily news record um, you, 
two of your three losses obviously came to App State. They they have great rim protectors and Duke Duke hasn't blocked a ton of shots this year, but they did last night against Vermont. Um, is that something that you're looking at, like with Filipowski attacking him a different way than you know maybe he's given you trouble before? Yeah, I mean Filipowski, you know he's he's huge, and um, it's not even the ones he blocks sometimes, the ones he affects, and um, you know you gotta. You know, do certain things with, with shot blockers. Um, you hope he's not around the rim the entire game. Um, you got a shot fake, and you got to pass sometimes to make wise decisions. Um, but you know, every game's kind of kind of different thing. You know, their style of defense is is different than than what you mentioned um, with, with what they're going to do and how they're going to play. So um, he's everywhere, um, but he's um, he, he affects the game on offense and defense. And defense, uh, Filipowski, you know, definitely gets his hands on a lot of them. We're going to stay on that same side of the aisle, row four, and then we'll go to the other side of the room. Go ahead. Herbert Delance, CBS TM. Coach, congratulations on the win. Um, how great was it last night to have all the support, not only from your J James Madison fans, but from the, the, the crowd in general? How great was that? Yeah, the crowd was electric last night. And um, I'm glad we gave them something to cheer about and, and, and get behind. And uh, we saw our section with purple in it, and, and obviously they were fanatic and crazy and loved it, but we felt like the rest of the arena supported how hard our team was playing as well. And um, so we're, we're hoping we can find that again tomorrow. Maybe some more JMU fans are driving up or, or, or find their way there, but uh, if anybody's not a JMU fan, be one tomorrow night for us. We'll, we'll take you on. We're going to the other side of the room. We'll start in row one and then work our way back. Jackson Hubbard from the Breeze. Great to see you again, Coach. Um, you, know, you started your career as a graduate assistant at UVA, and then you moved, you, after you know, leaving, you came back for a little bit, then you went to Virginia Tech. Those are two programs that know Duke probably a little bit more than they wish they did. Um, you know, just talk to me about what are your sort of, you know, just from you know, the perspective of coaching against the Blue Devils really early on in your career during Coach K's time, you know, what is kind of your just general thoughts on them just as a program in general? Well, a historic basketball program, and that goes without saying. And it's, um, you know, with Coach K, the national championships, the, the pros, um, you know, Cameron Indoor, it, it, it's one of um, you know, the elite programs in, in college basketball. You know, our, my viewpoint and, and all that is, you know, that we got to play 40 minutes tomorrow, maybe, maybe a little bit more. Um, it, that doesn't carry over into this game. You know, the pros and the legacy and everything else. Um, you you got to be able to be good tomorrow night when the ball's tipped up. And, and, and that's, where, that's where we're focused on. You know, we're not worried about their history or, their, or, or the, the previous great players or the team and everything else. We're worried about their current team and what's the best chance we have to try to be able to beat them. And that's where all our focus is. Stay on that same side in row three. How would you just describe this year, you know, uh, start with the Michigan State win and Kent State and then to be where you are now with program record wins and you get to share a court with Duke, a uh, chance to go to Sweet 16. Just Is it kind of beyond your wildest expectations? If I ever took time to think about it, yes, it would be. And um, so far in the season, and it's always what's next and what I got to do next. And, and there'll come a point, you know, when, when we're finished, and we, we count the wins up, we cherish the memories, and we do all that stuff. But we're eager for more right now. I'm that way. The players are that way. We've done a lot of great things. We know it. But we can't control what's behind us, you know, whether it's good or bad, and it's been a lot of good. We're focused on you know, right here, right now, and, 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 and trying to be the best we can at this situation, trying to make more memories, trying to make it even more special. We're back one more row. Uh, Nicole Auerbach, The Athletic. Um, Mark, kind of piggybacking off of this, um, obviously you can't control your draw and who you play, um, but what does it mean, you know, as, as the program trying to accomplish what you guys want and believe that you absolutely believe to be here, that you do have to go through a Duke? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, every team that gets to this point has done some really good things. Uh, you, it's not a lottery system. You don't just show up in the round of 32. And, you know, you got to win your non-conference games, your conference games, and we had to win our tournament to get here. And so everybody's earned their way here. And whoever advances between us and Duke tomorrow night is going to earn that too. And we're not taking it any more than that. It's, it's, it's an opportunity. 
Um, we're going to go out, compete. That's what we've done in every single game. And we're going to go out and try to go 1-0. and That's what we try to do in every single game. So we're not going to make it any different than what it is. Um, our guys believe in a certain way of playing. I believe in a certain way of coaching that we're going to try to figure out the best way to give us a chance to win and go out and do it. We'll stay, keep going, row five on the aisle. David Teal with the Richmond Times-Dispatch. Mark, did it add in any way to the satisfaction to win on the same day that <clears throat> Brad Brownell did and then to have Bobby Crimmins in the arena last night? Yeah, so first, Brad Brownell, um, I got a text from him right, you know, late last night, and I could tell he was up watching film. Um, you know, he, he's such a great basketball mind, and, he, and we bounce ideas off of each other. And um, I got one of his former assistants, um, Matt Buckland, on staff. So he puts us in a group message, and, and we're cheering for them. Uh, one of my, my former point guard is down there on Clemson as well, Billy Donlin, is on staff. And so, um, you know, we got some ties to Clemson. And, and uh, I didn't know Bobby Crimmins was going to be here. And, um, and, and sure enough, I saw a picture of him last night. And I was almost mad at him that he didn't come down and say hi, come down. Uh, but that's who he is. It's never about him. Um, he wants to blend in. He wants to cheer. He wants support. And um, uh, I'm glad he's here. He, he's, he, I, I always feel like he has magic in him. And um, he's, his personality and tournaments and feel. And um, if he's in the building cheering for us, I like that. We're going to come on the other side of the room here. Row three, go ahead. Just read. Yeah, so Coach Nels. Jamal Murphy, Bill Road, No Sports. For tomorrow night, are there, you know, what, you know, small facets of the game you really want to come out on top? And if, you, like, if you looked at the box scope besides the score but, and you saw that you won these areas, you would be happy, win or lose. Are there areas like that? Yeah, I mean, we want the pace of game to kind of go in our way. And, um, you know, one thing, you know, when I'm studying Duke and the teams they had in the past are really fast paced. And, and this is more of a lower possession team. Um, but they're almost playing NBA style of basketball, picking on matchups and putting the ball in certain guys' hands and, 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 and doing a great job of letting their best players make plays. And so we got to look at it the tempo. You know, we, we can't force the tempo and be crazy, but I hope the tempo is, is a faster paced game. And, and then when you're, when you're playing a team like that, you got to battle and withstand adversity. And, you know, the, the runs, you, you can't have many runs. If they have them, you got you to stop them and come right back. And, but you're going to have adversity. And you, you can't let it overwhelm you. You got to figure out a way to bounce back from it. I see a hand raised on the Zoom call right now, Dan Tortora. So I'm going to uh, allow him to talk. Dan, go ahead. You're on. Dan Tortora, wakeupcalldt.com. Coach, just what it means for you to represent JMU. A lot of people, bracket-wise, thought that this could be an upset, but I know that from a coach's point of view, you're not looking at an upset. You're looking at the strength of your team. So just all season long, what it means to wear JMU on your heart. Yeah, I mean, we never think of it as an upset. Um, you know, it's um, college basketball. I mean, it's unpredictable. Um, a lot of things can happen, and, and anything can happen in a game. So you got to, you know, be good that day, that night. Um, those people that picked us in their bracket, thank you. I hope we keep making you right. Um, you know, it's, it's one of those things where I think it's one of the coolest sporting events. Actually, I think it's the coolest sporting event out there. I mean, um, the enthusiasm those first couple of days of the tournament and, and people getting around watching games and, and, and families, friends, everything else. So I'm glad we're a part of it. I'm glad we're on the national stage. And uh, I hope we keep making a run. Any more questions for Coach? OK. Coach, appreciate it. Thank we'll you. see you tomorrow. OK. James Madison locker room is still open. I believe it should be open for another 10, 12 minutes.